Well, good morning, everyone. Perhaps we can get started. So, on the obstacle course. Okay. So, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day two of this uh, National Academies Committee. Um, I'd just like to recognize that Dr. Deborah Glickson, who's the director of the Water Science and Technology Board, is joining us today. I think it's quite unusual to have two directors from the National Academies, and I think it's just indicative of the um, interest and commitment of the National Academies in this effort. So this morning, we're going to be covering Old and River, Middle River flow management. Uh, we've got two presentations. The first will be given by the California Department of Water Resources. I'll ask the committee to hold questions after that. We'll then go to the US Bureau for Reclamation, and then we'll invite the presenters to come up front and we'll uh, do a Q&A session on uh, your both presentations. So the first uh, speakers, uh, Brian Giorgio, who's section manager and senior engineer. Uh, he's the export manager responsible for optimizing the state water project uh, while meeting regulatory and environmental requirements of the Delta. So right at the heart of what we're taking a look at. And Dr. Brian Schreier, also with Department of Water Resources. He's the lead smelt biologist with the Department of Water Resources. He's responsible for implementation of the Long Fin Smelt Science Plan. Uh, he's responsible for the State Water Plan compliance with the 2019 Biological Opinion and the 2020 incidental uh, take. He's been with DWR for more than 15 years. He was heavily involved in the Yolo Bypass floodplain research, uh, which we've heard about, and uh, has also been involved in some of the early application of eDNA technologies. Yes. So welcome both of you. I don't know who's going to go first. Go okay, yeah. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so, as Peter mentioned, I'm Brian Schreier with DWR. I um, want to also acknowledge uh, Brian Maharjo from USBR who have contributed to these slides. Uh, we've got Brian, Brian, and Brian here. So, hopefully, you can keep us all straight. Uh, and I'm going to be talking at a very high level about uh, OMR flow management and conceptual models around how species are interacting with OMR flows. Oof. Down arrow, maybe. Love it. Nice. <laughs> Redirect notice. That's not good. I feel like I'm breaking it more. Oh, okay. <laughs> I broke it already. Hey. So let's go. <laughs> so uh, for those of you that were on the field trip in January, uh, you'll hopefully recognize uh, some of this uh, these areas. Drove along Old River for a bit, saw the export facilities, salvage facilities at the CB at the SWP. Um, again, very high level just to establish. We're gonna be talking about OMR here. OMR is Old and Middle River flows. We're talking about these two channels, Old and Middle River and the South Delta that lead down to the export facilities, which are denoted by the, the two gold stars. 
And hearkening back to Dr. Summer's presentation from uh, January, we've got these three tiers of water that are going to the export facilities. The first being from the San Joaquin River, uh, the second being from the Sacramento River to the north, which is by far the largest uh, proportion of the freshwater flows going to the export facilities. And then tier three, the one we try to generally avoid, the uh, brackish water coming from the bay. Um, as I mentioned, most of the time that uh, export water is coming from the Sacramento River, which sets up uh, an interesting hydrologic dynamic in the Delta where we've got water moving north to south across the Delta. Pre-export facilities, we would have had water in the southern part of the Delta moving from the southeast up to the northwest with a natural flow of the San Joaquin River. Therefore, we end up with a situation where we have uh, reversing flows. Now, it's important to remember here that the entire delta is tidal, and any instantaneous moment, any place in the delta can have either positive or negative flows, depending on your orientation. Flows are moving back and forth. What we're talking about here is tidally averaged daily flows uh, that are the net movement of water is either in a positive direction or a negative direction. And here, positive direction is that natural flow of the river towards the ocean, uh, in this case from the south to the north, and the negative flow is opposite of that, which would be uh, in that uh, north to south direction towards the export facilities. Um, so going into some of the seasonality of our listed fish species, uh, I throw up a lot of stuff here. This is just showing for each of our listed fish species uh, where they're observed in the delta and where we have observations and salvage. Um, I don't put this up here to give you any kind of immediate detail, but just to highlight that we have an OMR management season that conveniently and, and purposefully overlaps uh, where all of these fish species are occurring in the delta. So there is a heavy amount of seasonality to listed fish species. They've uh, mostly been kind enough to all show up at the same time. Um, we have uh, flows in the winter and no flows in the summer. So that's um, not a coincidence. Um, and our OMR management season is around that period where we have that potential for entrainment because of fish species present. Um, so OMR management season kicks off, uh, can kick off in December 1. There's some flexibility in different triggers on how we on-ramp OMR management season. That flexibility primarily exists in the December uh, timeframe, December 1 to January 1. Uh, by January 1st, we have a hard on-ramp for OMR management season. Uh, and then that goes clear through to June, where we can either have an early off-ramp uh, or a calendar off-ramp at the end of June. Um, so I'm going to go back to the, the map again. and. Uh, really emphasize that when I'm talking about managing OMR flows for the protection of the list, these listed fish species, we're really dealing with fish these fish coming at us from all directions. So we've got the smelts coming at us from the west as they migrate upstream for spawning, and we've got the juvenile salmonids that are migrating downstream both on the San Joaquin and on the Sacramento side. So managing fish getting entrained from multiple different directions um, and different timing and uh, and rates is creates a challenging situation that we uh, try to adapt to uh, every year. Um, I'm going to again revisit some terminology here just to make sure we're all on the same page. So when we're talking about entrainment, um, entrainment is really specific to the. Uh, it's important to know the context with which anyone is particularly talking about entrainment. So we can have entrainment from the lower San Joaquin River into the Omar Corridor. We'd have entrainment of fish into the salvage facilities themselves. We'd have entrainment of fish into Clifton Court Four Bay. Um, so I'll try to be careful in how I say that and encourage uh, others to be careful about when we're talking about entrainment, specifying exactly what we're talking about. Um, and here for this talk, mostly I'm talking about entrainment of those fish into the Omar Corridor, which then triggers Omar flow management to prevent entrainment of fish into the actual salvage facilities. Uh, then we have salvage. Again, it should be very familiar to you since you saw our salvage facility uh, at the, the SWP. Um, salvage is where we uh, collect these fish from the water getting exported um, so that we can uh, truck them back up uh, away from the export facilities. 
Uh, and then for certain species, notably our salmonids, we also have loss, which is a calculation that's applied to salvage to take into account, provide estimates for the number of fish that were lost due to mortality as part of the salvage and entrainment process. Um, most notably covering uh, predation uh, across Clifton Court for me. Uh, so now we'll go into some concepts about how we manage our exports in relation to all these regulations. Uh, so I like to refer to this as kind of the multi-layered onion of all the different regulations we have in the Delta. Um, and this is just a smattering of what Brian can go into a lot more detail on. Um, at the highest level, we have just our raw infrastructure capacity. So the pumping plants have a certain maximum capacity. The aqueducts that that water goes into have a certain maximum capacity. Um, so given no limitations regulatorily, we have uh, a certain capacity to the system for exporting water. And there are certainly periods like last year where we had a lot of water in the system where that is the limiting factor for exports. Um, next down from that, we have storm flex operations that allow us during certain circumstances to be able to uh, increase exports during certain storm events. Uh, we then have both the state and federal endangered species acts that uh, layer on the OMR management. And of course the biological opinion OMR management is the key part of what this panel will be evaluating. Um, and then we also have uh, D1641, which is water rights decision from the State Water Resources Control Board that governs both SWP and CVP operations uh, with respect to water quality and flow criteria. And I'll, go, I'll touch on that in a little bit more detail as well. Uh, then we have drought operations. We can have temporary urgency change orders that adjust those D1641 requirements uh, during severe drought um, uh, circumstances. Uh, and then at the most basal level, we've got health and safety minimum exports. And this is an important thing to remember too, is that uh, for combined for the CBP and the SWP, 1500 exports, and note that's not OMR, it's 1500 CFS exports, um, is required to meet uh, statutory health and safety needs. And that includes things like minimum refuge supplies on the CBP side, um, senior water right holder obligations. And on the SWP side, there's actual municipal um, uh, offtakes from the, the SWP that will become dry and not have any water to pump if we go below that health and safety minimum. So we need to provide that water so that particularly residents of the South Bay um, have their residential water supply. Um, oh, another concept here. So with this multi-layered onion, these shift around in their priority as we go through the season. Um, we have a term we call controlling factor for operations. When we refer to something that's controlling, it's whatever is the most restrictive of this late, this multi-layer of regulatory environment. So that can change uh, even day to day. It changes week to week. It changes, um, can change quite frequently. And really that is maybe the best summation of Brian's job during the Omar management season is figuring all of that out. Uh, so I touched on D1641. Uh, D1641 um, has water quality and flow criteria um, for a variety of different, I put this figure up here just to drive home the point that it in and of itself is not one regulation, but has a number of different standards in it. Um, none of these are direct OMR flow management though, but a lot of these during, uh, even during the OMR flow management period can control exports. Uh, which has a direct impact on what the realized OMR flow levels are um, in some circumstances. Uh, and now I want to dive a little bit more into OMR flow management and cover at a high level some uh, bins of the types of OMR fl uh, flow management uh, that we uh, conduct. So the first of those are what I kind of call the ecosystem response. Um, OMR flow management uh, criteria, and that a good example of that, perhaps really the only example, is first flush, um, where we're responding to the first flushing flows in the estuary uh, for the protection of migrating delta smelt. Um, and this is really meant to be a in response to a, a system wide event, uh, taking preventative action to uh, keep upstream migrating delta smelt from being placed into an area where they would be at further risk later in the season 
for subsequent entrainment uh, into the salvage facilities. Uh, we then have real-time species management response. So this is where we're responding to either detections and monitoring or de detections and salvage, uh, and then limiting OMR to respond to that. And in particular, when we're doing this for salvage, um, I think Lenny touched on uh, yesterday the notion that we want to try to find opportunities to be more prescriptive and less reactive. Responding to salvage is, of course, the most reactive we can really get, where we have fish that are already entrained, they're already affected, and we're responding with OMAR management to limit further entrainment. Uh, if we could prevent that salvage, um, those are opportunities that we're constantly looking for. Uh, and then we have uh, minimizing the treatment using environmental surrogates and smelt guy. So I'm thinking of Delta smelt here primarily. Um, two examples for Delta smelt, we have a temperature threshold where we uh, use that as an indicator of when we should uh, switch from entrainment uh, management for adults to entrainment management for larvae. Um, and then for turbidity, for both of those life stages, uh, we utilize uh, water clarity metrics for as a surrogate for smelt presence, um, most notably because we uh, don't have a lot of smelt detections, as has been uh, highlighted several times now. Um, so visiting OMR uh, flow levels uh, and and what those kind of where those come from. Um, so for the OMR management season, we have a baseline of a negative five thousand uh, OMR, and this is um, you know I mentioned uh, hard on ramp uh, January first through uh, the off off ramp in in June. Uh, this level is well supported in the literature for a wide variety of species as being an inflection point where we below which. Uh, more positive than which, be specific, uh, more positive than which we see uh, reduced levels of uh, detection and salvage, and more negative than which we see elevated levels. And here I just, for the sake of having some examples from Gravalo et al, have a couple of figures for Delta and Longfin smelt, highlighting that negative 5,000 uh, inflection point. Uh, notably, you know, we don't have zero salvage, we don't have zero entrainment when we're more positive than negative 5,000. And even when OMRs are positive, uh, we often still see some limited uh, salvage. Um, in that range that I highlighted before, that kind of negative 1,200, negative 2,000 to negative 5,000, that room we have to adaptively manage within a season. Um, generally speaking, we consider more positive OMRs in that range to be more protective and to have less entrainment risk. So now I'll go into uh, some conceptual models of how some of our listed species are moving around uh, the delta and how they're interacting with the OMR corridor. Um, so for uh, delta smelt, um, we've seen this figure a couple times now. So we have uh, adults moving upstream uh, with that first flush action in the winter um, spawning, and then those resulting larvae are in the freshwater estuary until they move back downstream to the low salinity zone uh, later in the spring, early summer. And during both of those uh, life stages for adults and for larvae, um, we do have entrainment here, um, referring to the mass conceptual model um, that you've seen the um, entrainment effects on as a source of mortality for both of those life stages. And we have a, a pretty diverse and, and deep robust uh, amount of literature that supports uh, this. Um, next for longfin, uh, Longfin are definitely a little bit behind on our understanding of some of the nuances of their life history, but we've learned a lot in the last several years. Um, on the left is our kind of old conceptual model from maybe 10 years ago where we had uh, Longfin down in the Outer Bay and Pacific Ocean moving upstream into the freshwater delta to spawn where those resulting larvae would be at risk of entrainment to the OMR corridor, and which is in uh, red in the, on these uh, maps. Um, based on some new uh, otolith microchemistry work, um, new genetic analyses, new sampling in uh, bay tidal marshes, we now understand that longfin are spawning across a wide array of habitats uh, in areas of the delta um, and, and bay. And really only that uh, most inland portion of the population is moving far enough to have uh, to be at any risk of entrainment. 
Um, and we have a couple of recent papers that have highlighted uh, and spoke and quantified uh, estimates of this amount of larval loss uh, at the facilities. And we're in the half a percent to two to 3%. Um, notably for long fin, there is a high association with outflow uh, where when we have reduced outflow, uh, long fin tend to come further upstream to spawn. And when we have higher outflow, um, we often have uh, far less long fin, even zero long fin in the areas where we would expect them to be uh, at risk of entrainment. Uh, so now moving to um, Chinook salmon, I'll talk about Chinook salmon kind of generally and then go into um, our two listed runs. Um, so our listed salmonids are moving downstream through that second tier, through the Sacramento River corridor. Uh, and there's really two ways that they can enter the Delta. Uh, and uh, very, very fortunately, tomorrow you're gonna get to see the Yola bypass actually activated with water on it and salmon on it, which is a very exciting thing to see. Um, the Sacramento River main stem is the primary conduit for salmon to come down into the Delta. Um, when we do not have flood flows, when we do have that floodplain activation and do have water going down to Yolo Bypass, that provides another uh, conduit routing uh, route for those juvenile salmon to come down into the Delta. So not only is Yolo Bypass providing a lot of benefits to juvenile salmon with increased growth, increased survival, increased food resources, uh, but it also provides a route for them to bypass some of the entrainment uh, corridors down into the interior Delta and the Omar corridor. Um, and speaking of that entrainment into the interior delta, for those fish in the Sacramento River that come down, we have three primary pathways where they can be entrained into the uh, interior delta. Um, and several of these should look familiar. We saw these on the field trip in January, uh, the Delta Cross Channel Gate, the Georgiana Slough, and Three Mile Slough. Um, notably, for a couple of these, we've got infrastructure that exists to prevent that entrainment. For the case of the Delta Cross Channel, we've got the Delta Cross Channel gates, which you saw, that completely occlude that uh, pathway and keeps any salmon from moving in there during certain times of the year. Uh, and then notably in Georgiana Slough, we recently completed construction of the bioacoustic fish fence, which is reducing entrainment of uh, juvenile salmon into that pathway into the interior delta. Um, all of which is the goal is to keep those fish in the Sacramento River uh, so that they're not ending up in the interior delta. And I should mention that that interior delta, not only is it uh, a conduit for fish to move down into the Omar corridor and then subsequently get uh, detected and salvage, but we also have within that interior um, delta corridor, much reduced survival, uh, much higher mortality for those juvenile sal uh, salmonids, um, primarily through predation um, by introduced predators. Uh, so looking at winter run specifically, um, we have winter run spawning below Keswick Dam in the nor extreme northern part of the Sacramento River, taking about six months to move downstream to the Delta. Um, once we uh, have fish showing up in the Delta, we're dealing with the fry and smolt life stages, and that's where our OMR management comes into play. So we've got uh, OMR management that's um, uh, uh, in place for the specific times that we'd be concerned about OMR uh, entrainment of winter run. Uh, similarly for spring run, the OMR management uh, system works um, somewhat similarly. Notably for spring run, we've got uh, a bit more diversity in timing, and we've got the yearling life stage that's also present in the Delta. Um, and we have multiple source populations. So whereas winter run is spawning um, just below in the Sacramento River, just below Keswick, we've got spring run from multiple different tributaries, um, though notably all entering the Delta through that uh, Sacramento River corridor. Oh. I should also note that for winter run salmon, we've got what we call a juvenile production estimate. I think Brian's going to go into that a bit more uh, later. That gives us a number of an estimate of the total number of fish that are produced every year. And then that gives us benchmarks by which we can set triggers for, uh, for salvage management and OMR management. Uh, we don't currently have that tool for spring run, but we're currently developing that. That's uh, a very uh, complex and large project that involves uh, new monitoring um, and a lot of coordination across the watershed. Uh, and then finally, we have steelhead, which we're 
very much now in the middle of a surprise steelhead salvage event uh, that's uh, triggering uh, OMR management. Um, steelhead, we have a much greater diversity with the age of out migrants um, across multiple different years. We have uh, a much greater degree of variability and timing of out migration and generally less uh, well understood um, factors that contribute to uh, out migration. Um, generally, OMR management still works the same, roughly as we have for the Chinook salmon. Um, but notably for steelhead, we also don't have as great of monitoring. They're end exiting through the delta at a little bit larger size, uh, and we don't have very good gear efficiency in any of our monitoring for them. Uh, and now I'll hand it over to Brian to talk about calculating OMR. All right. Uh, so so far, it's been kind of a conceptual idea for for old or old the middle river flow. Uh, but now we'll go into kind of the more practical application of um, how we calculate it. So from the initial studies and everything, we're based on uh, actual measurement of old, old the middle river uh, based on two USGS gauges, um, the, kind of on the south side of Bacon Island, uh, one at Old River at Bacon Island, the other one's called Middle River at Middle River. Um, but yeah, USGS gauges there that they collect uh, hourly stage or uh, but continuous stage and flow readings, um, and, but then they apply a Godin filter to it uh, to eliminate the short term tidal cycle uh, from the data and kind of flatten it out. Uh, it does require three days of continuous data and it kind of averages out to the middle point, which causes some problems that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, yeah, so. Uh, the initial biological opinion, 2008, 2009, used this uh, calculated value or this sum of these two tidally average stations uh, in the regulation. Um, they do it on a 14 day average and then seven day. Uh, but we had to maintain or more and more positive than those readings, uh, they're staying compliance. Um, I admitted that good and filter did require a three days worth of data. So if you had one hour missing hour anywhere, you could potentially lose three days worth of tidal average data, uh, which made meeting a seven day average kind of difficult when half your data was missing. Um, in addition, the gun filter, because it took the center point, uh, you're always a day lagged. So you're operating today without knowing what happened yesterday. And for power scheduling, we're planning a day or two in advance. So again, tricky with a uh, trying to get a seven day average when we only have part of the data to work with. Uh, so for a practical matter, um, midway through those biological implementations, biological, biological opinions implementation, uh, we moved over to what's called the Old Middle River Index method of um, determining Old and Middle River, uh, estimating Old and Middle, old and middle River flows. Uh, this was based on work by Paul Hutton, uh, based um, running through many DSM-2 simulations and calibrating an equation that was effectively a mass balance of the South Delta, um, but uh, calibrating what, how you split. Uh, so the main input is the San Joaquin River flow um, based on physical structures within the South Delta uh, particularly Grantline Canal and previously the head of Old River Barrier that would reduce, would, would basically split the San Joaquin River into what goes down, uh, further down and what moved into Old River. Um, subtract out the exports at uh, the two main projects as well as two of the Contra Costa diversions and a percentage of the total in basin use calculations from the day flow uh, the result being what left over, what was left over was that combined Old Middle River flow. Um, again, uh, but when we moved into 2019, 2022 uh, actions, those were all based on the Old Middle River Index, uh, which simplified matters on a practical level significantly. Uh, again, that main input is just that San Joaquin River flow which if there are missing data points, it is outside the tidal boundary, so it's easier to estimate and fill the data. Uh, it also uses the previous day's Vernal's flow to, uh, as the input for today's, ultimate, today's OMRI value. 
Uh, so we know exactly what, hey, we plan to do this export today. This is what we know the old the, um, Omar is. Uh, so it made planning for and demonstrating uh, much easier. Uh, in addition, because this, it was a very tidal and very natural system, uh, a lot of other factors can influence the measured, uh, the USGS tidally filtered uh, flows, particularly if there's a tidal anomaly in the bay, if stages are a foot higher than anticipated, that would propagate up and make Old River flow unexpectedly more negative. Uh, so you don't have half the data and suddenly one data point is significantly far off from what you expect. Again, it made operating to uncompliance tricky. Uh, so we moved into this as a practical matter. Um, next, we're gonna roll, I'm gonna roll into kind of how some of the last couple of years have been. Um, 2021 was incredibly dry, but then so was 2022. So we ended up very having very little time where Old and Middle River flow was actually controlling our operations. Um, there was water quality uh, through uh, for the end, beginning of the water year and the end of the calendar year. But near the very, just near the end of December, there was a bit of a storm that came through, gave us a bit of hope, later we dashed. Um, and we triggered the first flush action, which is a minus 2000 OMR for 14 days. Um, but then, yeah, we rolled through the rest of January and things were looking, okay, we're, there weren't too many fish related actions and we were able to hold that minus 5,000 OMR baseline. Um, but we rolled into February, things were incredibly dry. We dropped off significantly, but not for an OMR control. Uh, there's 4 D 1641 and their spring X2 requirements. Um, but things just got worse as the year went on. We ended up being uh, at our basically health and safety minimums for significant periods. And um, so really third party water started coming into the system in uh, July to move through our exports. And it really wasn't until the start of the next water year that we're starting to actually use, move project water from North to South, all of it was being used for. Uh, outflow in D1641. Um, but the next year was quite different. Again, we started that year managing to water quality, um, but then we started off uh, January. We had two, three days of a minus 5,000 for the baseline, but triggered that first flush actually on the last day of December, but then it took a day or two to implement it through power marketing. And that controlled us through uh, the first 14 days, next 14 days. But then their turbidity actions for um, Delta Smelt controlled us at a minus, uh, still keep maintaining the minus 2000 OMR for a couple of days. Um, then the storm just kept coming. And suddenly, uh, mid January, we're able to maximize Clifton Cord exports to the physically, we, the most we could physically do. Oh, which ended up being uh, just over 9,000 CFS at Clifton Court and Jones able to maintain their full exports. But even with that, there was so much flow, Omar was positive. Um, but relatively short lived, uh, just around 10 days at that maximum, uh, drifting down as uh, um, the month came to an end. And in February, those same water quality standards that controlled us in um, 2022 were uh, come down in February uh, 2023. Um, but with the significantly uh, dry years previous, the governor uh, requested and was uh, going to authorize a relaxation of the most restrictive parts of D1641 for that month. Uh, so the, we fell back into that next layer of the onion, uh, which was the minus 5,000 OMR for the first part of February. Um, but then some smelt actions for the ITP started triggering, triggered more uh, negative OMRs or more positive OMRs. And then again, we, then we got to the end of March or the beginning of March and another series of wet storms came and we maximized to the fullest we could in our system again. And that lasted through all of the spring. Now, a slight difference being that at this point, we were actually filled up all of our Southern reservoir storages and it was actually our south of the delta capacity that started limiting in us as opposed to the early in the season when it was uh, at the actual export facilities. Um, 
Flow started to drop off early July and uh, water quality started to control us for DC-1641. Um, but then we rolled into the Fall X2 action starting in September. Um, and that brought us into how this year started off. Uh, we switched to a daily average for this one so we can see some of the finer details. Uh, but Fall X2 uh, controlled our operations for October. Um, and you know, as a dip positive there, as all of our reservoirs were required to decrease down to minimum and stream flow requirements, well, not quite to that level, but had to reduce back to prevent reduce down to prevent stranding uh, within the upper system. Uh, that forced exports to uh, cut back in order to maintain water quality for X2 as best we could. Uh, but yeah, ended up with positive OMR for a little bit there. Um, then post. Uh, at that point uh, into November, we're operating to um, these internal requirements, particularly for net delta outflow. Um, that is uh, another indexing method, uh, kind of based off the day flow uh, um, program, but basically a mass balance of all the inflows into the delta versus all the exports. What's left over is the outflow. Uh, but that required that controlled us through most of November and into December. Uh, but then water quality started to degrade. And we really started to cut back exports to try to keep that up. But we started off January again with that baseline OMR minus 5,000 action given to effect. Um, and that will, will control this for the first part of January until an ITP action required the SWP only to reduce back and meet a more restrictive OMR. Um, but then again, first flush triggered uh, near the end of January. Uh, that held us in that minus 2000 until early uh, February, um, at which point at one day where we could meet the minus 5000, but other actions triggered us back to minus 3500. Uh, and past the point where this graph ends, we're now at a minus 2500 for steelhead protection. That's kind of how we've managed OMR for the last couple of years. <laughs> and it's an exciting ride bouncing from one thing to the next um yeah i'm not clear on what the knobs are you're turning uh, so the only do you control exports mm -hmm. out of the pumps mm -hmm. but do you have any other controls on omr no uh for net delta outflow and for other delta regulations particularly that are more for D1641, we can increase reservoir releases depending on the time of year and the conditions going on, uh, actually flood control, significant increases there. But really the only knob we can move to influence old mineral river flows is exports. Now, other projects do have reservoirs on the San Joaquin River that influence it as well. But as the department, we don't control any of those reservoirs. and. Uh, San Loss River is controlled by the CVP, but there it's not within their rights to control for uh, most of those kind of actions. Um, so, yeah, the only thing we as SRP and CVP can really do is change our exports. San is is Milwaukee. Yes, and and then Folsom doesn't give you any help. Well, it's uh, north of the Delta, so it won't impact the San Joaquin River. It's only going to go onto the Sacramento River which will affect things like uh, net delta outflow. Uh, you may have heard the term of Q West, which is gets influence on the Sacramento River through the cross channel gates in Georgiana Slope and Rio Vista flows uh, is another one that uh, Folsom and other North Delta reservoirs can help with. But yeah, Omar, uh, that really only the input is that San Joaquin River, which we don't have any control on. <laughs> Um, I just want to make sure I understand. So, um, Brian, you've been using these colored boxes to kind of indicate what this Brian had called the controlling factors, but his terminology didn't have OMR as a controlling factor. Um, if you go it's, back to slide five, yeah, the things he listed were CESA and the biops, mm -hmm. and they had, so is that what you? Please, yeah. so, please interpret that yeah. for me. So. so Within the CSA, the ITP, and those um, overarching regulations, OMR is one mechanism by which they can control operations. 
Uh, so it is in with it's within a bunch of those, and D six forty one is and Folix two is also within those documents. So okay, um, these are kind of more of the direct actions versus the right overarching regulation. The exception being D sixteen forty one is that overarching regulation. It has a couple actions with it. It has a lot of actions within them. Um, so I am mix matching between a couple things here, uh, but uh, in general, the D sixteen forty one and then the rest of them are uh, ESA or ITP related. Uh, okay, structures. and then you've answered my second question, which was the same thing with Polix two, which you hadn't listed as under either the BIOP or the ITP. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Got it. But, yeah, yeah, so we could further divide this red box here into ITP and BIOP, um, but where a lot of times we have alignment between those two permits, uh, and with our new reconsultation, we're trying to have complete alignment between those two permits. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the, they overlap, so. Can, can you clarify, mm -hmm. E1641, is that that suite of things associated with water quality is is that associated with upstream or downstream areas? Like I'm a little I'm I'm trying to understand how you have such large negative flows under that D1641 period, mm -hmm. which seems kind of unconstrained. But if your govern if the management objective is being governed by water quality, yeah, it really depends over the course of the year. Uh, where D1641's requirement force us to be. Uh, in the spring, it really tries to maintain, have us maintain water quality really in the Susu marshes and bay area. It's basically west of um, Collinsville, uh, so rest of the confluence. Uh, as we move into the summer, those restrictions change from uh, fish and wildlife based requirements to an agricultural based requirement. So it's really asked us to protect um, conditions and more in the central delta and in the south delta. Uh, south delta kind of runs all year long because it's somewhat independent from our operations in many respects, um, but it is there. Um, and then as you roll into the influence flows in positive and negative direction. Right. Thank you. So, Thank you. so then it could influence the flow in a positive and negative direction. Yeah, but. The OMAR flows are somewhat independent of those actions. Um, it's more of a consequence of act operating to something else. There is that OMR moving one way or the other. And it will depend on how much water supply we have to contribute. So if we have significant water supply, like in 2023, that OMR is going to be more negative because we're going to be moving more water from the north and exporting it south, which is going to make more OMR. Um, more negative, but we may be producing enough outflow to maintain those water quality conditions as same as we might otherwise on a lower flow condition. Uh, we'll just do it more through an export cut than a reservoir release, if, depending on if we have the water supply to achieve that. Great. So, find it. Is that the conclusion um, of this session, or did you have some other? Yeah, there was just questions slides. So, yeah, so, that's so, it. so perhaps what we'll do is sort so of move the one. recommendation and then take those questions together because you're yep, so yeah. integrated. Sounds okay. great. Okay, so the second presentation this morning is going to be given by U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, Brian Mahaji, who we've had uh, reference to a lot during the last two days, is a biologist with. Reclamation's Bay Delta Science Division. He's worked for more than 10 years on San Francisco Bay Delta issues. He's published on population genetics, fish community dynamics, and the implementation of machine learning tools uh, to this very complex system. His focus is on OMR management and monitoring to inform actions. Uh, the second speaker is Kat Pian with also with reclamation uh, and a fish biologist in the science division of the Bay Delta office. Uh, I'd also like to highlight that she's a Sea Grant State Fellow. For those of you not familiar, it's a wonderful program for attracting the best and brightest to show there's careers in federal and state agencies. So Kat, great to see that you're continuing your career uh, both in the system and with agencies. So uh, I don't know who's first up, Kat or Brian? Kat's first.
talking to my Hey everyone, um, thanks for being here. I'm Kapian, um, and I'll be sharing this talk today with Brian Maharja. So we're going to continue the OMR discussion by talking more about the actual monitoring and the data that goes into um, informing OMR management. So re review of regulatory context you just heard about. Um, you'll hear a lot of uh, things that Brian Trier uh, talked about earlier, but um, just to remind you briefly throughout the presentation what's relevant. Um, so on the federal side, we've got the, uh, the 2019 proposed action for the Central Valley project, um, and then the 2019 Delta smelt and some on its sturgeon biological opinions. On the state side, we have the 2020 incidental take permit for state water project operations. Um, the Interim Operations Plan, or IOP, is a court order that aims to align federal and state regulations. Um, you had heard that there are some differences in those um, two permits, and so, uh, yeah, there has been some effort to, to, uh, to have them be more similar, and each year there's a new IOP that comes out. The guidance documents, the links provided here, provide kind of a summary of OMR management, um, the governance involved, the uh, different actions. So it's a useful document that we refer to a lot um, to remind ourselves what we should be looking out for. So these uh, are the species and the approximate order in which we'll cover the species today. Um, we have Delta smelt, you've heard a lot about Delta smelt, um, long fin smelt, which are currently state protected and um, pending federal listing, winter run Chinook salmon, spring run Chinook salmon, Central Valley steelhead, and green sturgeon, which are um, covered in OMR management but don't really have any actions that are relevant. So we won't be really talking about that today. Um, there will be a focus on Delta smelt and winter run Chinook salmon for this presentation with a, a light touch on the other species. So um, just going over some of the teams, people that are involved in OMR management um, at, uh, so like Brian and I participate in the salmon monitoring team and the salmon monitoring team. The salmon monitoring team, um, even though it says salmon, also covers sur uh, green sturgeon. So Chinook salmon, steelhead, green sturgeon. Um, the smelt monitoring team covers delta smelt and longfin smelt, and these teams are made up of bio biologists and operators, um, and the agencies on the left are those that participate in the teams. We'll talk a little bit more about the products in the next couple of slides, but um, some of the things that these teams come out with is an outlook which summarizes um, mostly the water operations as well as some other um, information. Um, we also have two different versions of, a, there's a federal and a state assessment, um, which looks at the potential risk to species for that week. And then if it's relevant, uh, the teams provide recommendations and advice to management in terms of an OMR index. So those like negative 2000, negative 5000 numbers that you've been hearing about. The Delta Monitoring Work Group, DMW, is made up of water contractors and stakeholders. Um, basically, everyone gets together, and um, the anyone who's not on the teams can provide input on the risk assessment, uh, ask questions, clarifying questions for what happened for that week. And the Water Operations Management Team, or WAMPT, um, this is made up of regulatory agency managers and operators. So if there are any issues that come up during the um, SMT and SAMPT meetings or any recommendations or advice come up, um, this goes to want to be talked about and a, an operations decision is made. Um, this team doesn't just cover salmon and smelt monitoring team. It also will talk about some of the tributary teams, um, some of the other management teams as well. 
And so um, just going over again, some of the uh, tasks for salmon and smelt monitoring teams. So um, review a variety of data, including hydrologic, operational, water quality, and fishery data on a weekly basis from December to June. This provides opportunities for engagement between biologists and operators um, to talk through issues on both ends um, and provide relevant information on what's going on that week. Um, they then provide all of that input into the proposed action assessment and advice on the ITP risk assessment for WAMPT. And the results of those discussions are captured in all these documents that we listed as well as meeting notes. So quick screenshot of the outlook. Um, you'll see there are a couple different tributaries that'll be listed um, here, including the Delta. Um, and then there'll be anticipated weekly ranges. So looking at what are the, what's the storage, what are the releases, um, what are things like uh, exports, and then some related environmental and fish conditions and um, fish survey information. So what's happening that week? If, are there any disruptions? Um, and we can provide copies of that. Um, Brian will link to some of these documents later. The assessment document, so as I mentioned, there's two versions, there's the state version and the federal version. These both summarize any of the relevant data, hydrologic, environmental, fish data, um, and then leading to an assessment of the species status or risk for that week based on data and evaluation from the team members. Can we, can we get a mic? It's a little bit hard. Yeah, to I think we need, can, we, can you use a mic out? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. Is this the mic? Uh, we have a hand held one that was just oh. stronger. Uh, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You do have to hold it kind of close to your mouth. Okay. Very perfect. Thank you. Really loud. <laughs> okay. So, um, as I was just mentioning, there are two assessment documents the state and the federal assessment document. Um, these summarize the relevant data for that week. And um, come up with an ass assessment of species status or risk based on that data and evaluation of certain questions or discussions by team members. Um, again, as I mentioned, there um, may be recommendations or advice to want. This doesn't happen that often. It depends on what is relevant at that time and what the conditions are and if there's flexibility. Um, but yeah, that is summarized in these documents as well. So Brian talked about some of the different types of data used in OMR management. Um, here's just a reminder of some of those different kinds of data sources. So um, I broke this up into OMR management phase, which is onset, which is the start of OMR season, export reduction. So during the bulk of OMR season, um, there may be triggers that occur and leading to export reductions. And then off ramp, which is the end of OMR management season. So some of these are calendar based um, to start on a particular date, but um, in other cases, we use uh, environmental data such as for smell, flow, and turbidity, um, psychic depth, water temperature, other flow metrics, uh, as well as the presence and spatial distribution of fish. To um, These are the, the different types of data that can lead to uh, changes in OMR management. And then for salmon, this is mostly based on actual salmon presence, either in the delta or um, captured and salvage, so uh, daily or cumulative loss. I might just go really quickly through salvage since Brian talked about this as well, and you had a field trip already, but there is a state and a federal facility. Um, for the federal facility, we have the JT Fish Collection, um, facility and for the state water project, the senior Delta Fish Protection Facility was one of the big differences being that big reservoir collecting for four bay leading into senior fish facility and leading to more predation um, opportunities. And then there are a number of different terms that Brian covered. Um, salvage is actually observed in the salvage sampling. And then treatment incorporates also into it pre-screen loss and screen efficiency, um, which uh, incorporates predation loss in there as well. 
And then um, there's also handling and truck loss that can be associated with the fish actually detected in salvage. So when the fish are getting transported, some of them, um, they have mortality. So loss in the end is the treatment minus the, the number that survived the release. And calculation details can be found on the CDFW salvage FTP website. I should mention this is um, mostly used for cell monics. So the general goal for setting a take limit is that it should be based on population size. Um, the population size due to various factors can change from year to year. And so it makes sense that the take should also be determined based on how that population changes. So for some audits, as you heard about the JPE already, juvenile production estimate, which is the estimate of uh, juvenile some audits entering the Delta. Um, currently, the um, win currently winter run are the only species that are implementing JPE for um, the stake limit because the other species don't currently have a JPE developed. Um, but this is in development, and Brian Harjavik will cover this more later. The smell equivalent that has been used in the past is the Fall Midwater Trawl Survey Smelt Abundance Index. Um, this is an index that was used for um, the adult Delta smelt um, in the survey in the fall. And there, as you've heard, there's been a major decline in delta smell, and so this abundance index has declined and become a little bit less useful over time. Um, so there's been a movement towards environmental surrogates, um, as you have, a, you have also heard about, and we'll hear about more. And the way that um, this loss is actually used in uh, OMR management is that export reductions are taken when loss exceeds certain thresholds that are written into uh, the ITP and the VA. So moving into adult Delta smell detection data. So in the past, we had a number of surveys that were maybe seasonal or uh, year round that were conducted on a monthly scale. Um, these include spring Kodiak trawl, fall midwinter trawl, and base study. Um, a lot of these studies produced a delta smell index, and um, we're catching a lot of delta smell at the time. You can see the distribution of uh, sampling locations map. However, as the abundance index has declined, um, you can see it's been zero since 2018 for the fall midwinter trawl survey. Uh, it's been harder to um, know when delta smelt are doing. And so the Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring Program uh, was initiated in 2016 to be much more intensive. And uh, this program samples almost daily to produce a weekly delta smelt abundance index. And I think Rosie mentioned this yesterday, but this is the main survey where we actually see delta smell detections these days. Um, so we rely on this survey a lot and the survey will switch its sampling locations and gear based on the life stage that uh, is in play. So for larval and juvenile smelt detections, we have a number of surveys. The smelt larva survey um, targets more long fin smelt. It's a little bit earlier uh, in the water year. And the 20 millimeter survey um, kind of picks up where smelt larva survey ends and targets more of the delta smelt larvae and juveniles. Um, the enhanced delta smelt survey also samples as well. And um, at least for the state sampling, the detection of larval and juvenile smelt in the central and south delta can trigger certain actions. And just remember these stations will be on the next map as well. So due to the decline in delta smell detections, there has been a shift to environmental surrogates for some actions. These environmental surrogates are expected to reflect delta smell behavior. And 
you can see the environmental data stations highlighted on the map. Um, the All of the solid ones are measured with uh, continuous water quality sensors. Um, and then the blue stars are those South Delta stations. So the, that second data is collected during the fish surveys. Um, these surrogates represent different types of behaviors. So for example, the high flow and turbidity at Freeport, which is the top point, uh, reflects population scale migration, spawning migration based on studies such as from Aldo et al. 2009. And then uh, water hitting certain water temperature thresholds reflects um, a change in monitoring from adult delta smelt entrainment to uh, larval and juvenile delta smelt entrainment. And then low sucky depths and high turbidity represent greater potential for delta smelt presence in the South Delta and thus greater entrainment rates. So all of these um, triggers can uh, lead to actions being implemented. Um, so reductions in pumping or a change in, in um, actions that are relevant. Um, and then that last point at the bottom, Clifton Core 4 bay temperature also um, indicates the end of uh, OMR management season once temperatures reach a, certain, reach a certain threshold of being too warm for delta smell. So just a quick slide on long pin smell. These are safe protected and have a federal listing pending. They are slightly different from delta smell in that their um, life history is on a two-year cycle instead of an annual cycle. And they are distributed further west, all the way to the ocean. And so some of the surveys realizing um, their distribution have expanded uh, further west into San Pablo Bay. The data sources that I covered with Delta Smelt are also relevant to long and smelt. And um, some of the environmental and hydrologic information that are relevant are um, because long and smell are so associated with outflow, um, we have high flows on Sacramento or San Joaquin River offering things certain actions, um, believing that they are too far west to um, need those actions in place. Um, water year type can re reflect drought conditions, um, and so certain actions are only in place during dry years. Um, and then flow metrics such as outflow and QS are also used to um, help them form risk to long things. So to bring it all together, here's how smell data are used to inform water operations today. Um, some of the data sources, as we saw, include the current distribution of fish, including at salvage. So just seeing um, this informs kind of what is happening in their life stage, what kinds of movements are happening, where they are, are we seeing any? And um, recent delta smelt detections are mostly supplementation fish. You can see um, the yellow are the untagged fish that we've detected in 2023 and then 2024 thus far. So um, continued detections are really dependent on supplementation um, and the uh, number of fish being uh, added to the delta has been increasing. So we'll see how that translates to our detections. And then when fish are not present, um, a lot of the time at the beginning of the year before supplementation occurs, we rely on the historical distribution of fish based on literature um, and past data to inform where we think they are at that time. Uh, we also use environmental data, as you saw, to inform um, where they are and hydrologic data and modeling, which you'll hear a little bit more about in the next presentation. And SMT on a weekly basis makes a determination of risk that can be dependent on life stage and location. You'll see the table um, on the bottom is for the central delta and um, is broken up, but it's very small, but you, know, you can see a copy of it um, in our risk assessments. Uh, the risk levels are an ITP requirement and laid out in the ITP. Um, the risk levels align with different OMRI recommendations 
um, and can also inform management on salvage expectations. The risk determinations are not very quantitative and do have a lot of uncertainty around them. And the summarized data and risk levels are detailed in the assessment documents that you heard about. Um, there's not usually a need for a recommendation, but re recommendations are solicited when applicable. And with that, I'll hand it off to Brian to talk about SOL limits. Thanks, Kat. If it's okay with everybody, I'll try to project so that I can move my hands freely and gesticulate widely. Uh, well, do let me know if I'm not speaking loud. And, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Kat. So I'm gonna go over, uh, like she said, the Salman portion of this talk. Uh, and uh, I'll be going over primarily winter run because there are a lot of similarities, as we mentioned, across all the different salmonid species uh, in terms of how we manage them in the Delta. Um, and I think winter run Chinook salmon is a good one to go over because uh, it's probably the most well studied uh, out of the listed anatomous fish species. And it also it has the most well established OMR management framework. Um, and you'll probably visit this area to the right here. This is Keswick Dam. Um, it, you probably visit this next month. Um, so the uh, downstream of this dam is where uh, winter run uh, would spawn. So as we've already briefly touched upon, there's this juvenile production estimate or JPE, hopefully you can remember the acronym, um, that we try to kind of put together uh, before uh, winter run enters the Delta. Um, and you know we take advantage of the fact that it takes about half a year for um, juvenile salmon to migrate from the Red Bluff, uh, around the Red Bluff Diversion Dam area with the star up there, uh, all the way down to the Delta proper. Um, and uh, we wanna do this in advance. So we do forecast uh, the numbers ahead of time uh, uh, because we, you know it's easier to manage when we have a number, a static number that we uh, try to kind of manage for, towards uh, rather than changing the number dynamically uh, as we see fish within the Delta. Um, and, you know, I just want to want to note that this is estimated by taking advantage of the area that's up top there as uh, juvenile salmon uh, migrate downstream into the delta um, by looking at the number of winter run that uh, passed the red bluff diversion dam in terms of the number of fry. Um, and then we try to kind of estimate how many of those fry will become small. And of course, then we try to uh, estimate how many survive from the red bluff diversion dam all the way uh, to the delta. Uh, so once they're in the Delta, uh, we do have Delta monitoring in place, um, primarily to understand the timing uh, and the number of fish that are kind of entering and exiting the Delta. Uh, some of the example of uh, monitoring programs that we use uh, is Knight's Landing Rotary Screw Trap run by uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and this Delta Juvenile Fish Monitoring Program uh, run by the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, these are a combination of screw traps, uh, trawls, uh, uh, beach sands, as well as boat electrofishing. Um, there are key points like the Knight's Landing um, uh, screw trap, which is uh, in this area right here. Sorry, folks on the call. Uh, and then the, the Sacramento trawl are kind of the considered the entry points for winter run. Um, and then the Chips Island over here and the yellow uh, towards uh, past the confluence is kind of generally when we uh, what we use to kind of indicate when uh, salmon have exited the delta. So obviously, uh, this goes without saying, uh, it's not that we don't use the delta smell survey. Obviously, if we see salmon data in those surveys, we use them as well. These are just kind of the ones that we usually rely on. Uh, another key information that we typically use is acoustic telemetry. Uh, there are a lot of telemetry studies going on even today. Uh, but we use that to estimate movement and survival of four salmonids. Uh, and a lot of the data in the past and a lot of studies uh, using this acoustic tag data in the past have found that, like Brian Schreier mentioned, that survival is pretty low once fish enter the interior delta any, or anything south of uh, the Sacramento River. And this routing in terms of how many fish go in through the interior delta, how many stay in the Sacramento River is uh, driven a lot by hydrology. Um, and I have links here, which, you know, we'll share the slides afterwards, uh, which you can click uh, to kind of uh, see how the data looks like in real time. Uh, this is a website put together by Sir Michelle at NIMS. 
Uh, through these, uh, in part through this uh, telemetry studies, uh, this is why we have these uh, barriers in place that you've seen in previous field trip, I believe. Um, so as Brian Schreier mentioned, there are different junctions at which uh, uh, salmon can enter the interior delta. Uh, the first one that they typically encounter uh, is the delta cro uh, cross channel gate, uh, which as you probably saw in the field trip can be closed. Um, and we typically close them almost the whole entirety of the salmon migration period. Um, there's also the Georgian slough uh, non-physical barrier uh, that is uh, 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 that is uh, run by the state um, that is in place this year. Um, that's the one on the left and cross channel on the right uh, picture there. Um, but there are some kind of challenges. Uh, uh, there are additional challenges with managing managing for salmon in the delta once they enter the delta. Uh, if you recall this slide from Steve Lindley in the previous uh, uh, meeting. Uh, there's a diversity in terms of timing and behavior for these uh, salmon runs in the Central Valley. Um, and they are genetically distinct from one another. There's the fall run, uh, spring run, and winter run, and late fall run. Uh, but despite these differences, there's considerable overlap in timing. Uh, the runs are morphologically indistinguishable from one another. Uh, and if we focus on just the OMR management period that Brian Georgia talked about, and looking at just kind of the rearing and migration period, uh, you see that the different colors uh, have overlaps at a given month sometimes. Uh, but there needs to be a way for us to manage just for the list of runs or identify the list of runs. Uh, so that's where this length that date criteria uh, come in. Um, it was kind of a really clever way to uh, identify salmon run for practical purposes because it's fast, cheap, and easy. Uh, just kind of quick rundown of how that works uh, is that if you see the figure on the right, those colors are kind of a way for us to classify the different runs of salmon. Uh, so the colors I believe is in the red is the fall run, uh, green is late fall. And if we focus on just winter run, that would be kind of the blue. Uh, so at a given uh, date, uh, if they are within the particular size uh, in, this, in the blue area, then we would call them winter run. Uh, but, if, but, if, uh, but this results in a lot of misclassifications. So if they're perfect, so these panels are the different runs uh, that we identified based uh, on genetic data. So we know that these are the correct identification on these kind of uh, different rows. So if you focus on the kind of middle one here that I kind of highlighted in, in this black out, uh, line, outline, you see that the scatter plots sometimes deviate away from the blue uh, area. If it was 100% accurate, then everything would always be in this blue area. Uh, and you can see that there's not just a false uh, positive, there's also a false negative. So if you see in the fall and late fall uh, panels on the top two, there's a lot of uh, points within the blue line as well. Uh, and th this is also complicated. It's also further complicated by the fact that this error rates varies uh, from year to year. So because of this, there's been a lot of push in the past uh, couple of decades at least uh, to correct a, a lot of the, the identification that we do in the field and at salvage facilities uh, through this length of date criteria by using genetic assignment. Uh, so this is kind of the primary method that we use uh, for genetically IDing uh, salmon runs today. Uh, so this GT-seq uh, using single nucleotide polymorphism panel. Um, and uh, because we've advanced a lot of uh, the genetic technologies over the years, I think we've gotten down in terms of the speed of the processing all the way down to 48 hours. Um, but it's still not as fast as we would like, uh, even with rapid analysis, because typically uh, management agencies and, uh, and folks that manage the system uh, want an almost immediate response uh, based on what we see at the salvage facility. So that's all I'm gonna kind of touch upon on winter run. I'm just gonna highlight some key differences with spring run Chinook salmon. Um, so we don't currently have a threshold that we use uh, where we, if we hit a certain amount of uh, wild spring run or young, if you're spring run, we reduce pumping. Uh, so there's no weekly, daily or annual loss thresholds as you will probably see once you kind of go into those documents. Uh, but as, as Brian Schreier mentioned, there is this kind of yearling um, uh, migratory behavior where some fish might stick around in the freshwater for about a year and then they decide to out migrate when they're larger of larger size. Uh, so what we do typically uh, currently in the in the regulation is to use surrogate uh, by using a late fall hatchery fish, which are which are of similar size uh, as yearling spring run, 
Uh, and if we hit a certain number or certain percentage of this release, uh, then we take an action. Uh, some key issues that are kind of different from winter run is that um, there is some hybridization with fall run uh, for the species, uh, possibly to, due to a lot of the hatchery practices. Um, so it can make genetic identification difficult in the future. Um, uh, and there, as I mentioned, there is no juvenile production estimate established, uh, but I do want to note that the state have been working hard uh, towards kind of putting this together in the past uh, few years at least. All right, so moving on to Central Valley steelhead, um, there are a lot of things that we don't know about uh, this species. Um, they can now migrate um, and become anadromous at any point um, in their life. They can now migrate as young up here. They can wait for a year in the freshwater tributaries right. or maybe two years, three years, and decide to out migrate then. Um, there is no currently no annual loss threshold um, because we don't really have a way to estimate the population size that's coming into the Delta at the moment. Um, right now, the threshold is set based on just whatever we saw was the highest around 2010 to 2018. Um, and even though, but even though there's no JPE at the moment, uh, we do have a draft framework. Um, so, uh, Mike Beeks, uh, that used to work for reclamation and, uh, others from uh, a multi-agency team put together this, uh, uh, steelhead science plan, um, that is currently in, in, in draft, uh, in draft form, but we're happy to share that. Uh, so feel free to contact us about it, uh, where we try to kind of, uh, put together some, uh, rough plans of how we can potentially uh, work on putting together a JP framework. Um, so not only do we not know how many fish are coming in, it's also important for us to understand where which fish are coming from the Sacramento and how many, and which fish are coming from the south from the San Joaquin Basin. Um, and it has a very complicated life history. Um, so we also don't quite know um, what drives anatomy, right? So there's a lot of fish that are kind of uh, in the resident uh, freshwater form, uh, referred to as rainbow trout, that can um, become triggered to become uh, anadromous at any point. So it'd be good for us to know what drives that. Um, and as Brian Schreier mentioned, also there is low gear efficiency because these fish are bigger and they have better swimming capability. So it is hard to kind of determine what is best, uh, how to best monitor them in the Delta because our current methods don't really capture them that well. So all in all, what we do on a weekly basis in the monitoring teams that Kat mentioned is to estimate the distribution of, of the different runs, largely based on professional opinion, but also informed by data that we currently monitor, as well as historical data. Uh, we talk about what percentage of uh, each of the runs and the uh, steelhead uh, are we think are yet to enter the Delta, what percentage are in the Delta, and what percentage have exited the Delta. Um, and just kind of want to note that um, the salmon monitoring team, monitoring team believe that this is meant to reflect the actual listed runs as in genetic winter run and not length of date, even though length of date was really the information that we typically can rely on on a real time uh, basis. And I just want to note that there's also a determination of risk uh, similar to what we do in the snot teams. Uh, I also just want to mention that a lot of these data can actually be uh, accessed in a uh, real-time basis. So there's these two uh, web pages. Those are links on the underline there that you can click when you have these slides. And there's also Environmental Data Initiative website where we do uh, post the uh, QAQC, so the clean data sets um, that we've collected over the years that Luis Conrad and uh, Josh Israel have mentioned in previous uh, presentations. So uh, I also kind of want to just give a sampling of what we think are good information coming down in the pipeline. Um, so we talked about spring run JPE. So this is the work that the state uh, agencies have kind of spearheaded, uh, implementing additional genetic and field monitoring, as well as plans for uh, modeling for spring run. Uh, for steelhead, we do have a pretty comprehensive monitoring for steelhead in the Stanislaus River. Um, uh, spearheaded largely by reclamation, uh, that can serve as a good foundation for life cycle monitoring and uh, JPE as well. Uh, for a long fin smelt, there is a science plan that's been put together that you can check out, um, which is gonna work towards a life cycle model and understanding all the factors that are kind of driving its population dynamics. Uh, for Delta smelt, um, Kat mentioned that there are a lot of hatchery smelt that we're releasing uh, that we have been tagging with VIE, so we can kind of track where they go. 
And there's also future plans to do acoustic tagging to kind of uh, better understand their fine scale uh, movement and behavior. Um, there, we also have a lot of predictive uh, tools and modeling that can we can use to kind of forecast uh, what how many uh, fish are potentially going to come at salvage, which I will go over in the next session in the modeling presentation. We also have genetic tools. We always uh, improve our genetic tools. Uh, there's always new things um, that are being innovated. Uh, one thing that I want to mention is the parentage-based tagging, where we try to kind of genetically ID every single fish that are being spawned in hatchery so that we can track um, whether hatchery fish are truly hatcheries and exactly which hatchery they're coming from, uh, outside of from uh, coded wire tags that have been used in the past. And the one that I'm going to kind of just have an extra slide for is this uh, Sherlock assay. Um, stands for that. Uh, Title uh, there on the top. It's a little bit forced, but I mean, I think it's a cute name. Um, I think uh, so. This is a work that DWR has been kind of leading. Um, it's a CRISPR based assay originally developed for human pathogen detection. Um, so it's similar in that you use, uh, you take DNA from fin clips or mucus swab. But what's really uh, unique about it is that the CRISPR reaction happened um, at 37 degrees Celsius or human body temperature. And unlike the typical uh, DNA amplification that you think of with PCR, where it requires uh, wild changes in temperature, this one can react uh, at a pretty stable temperature. So the, the instrument itself is pretty cheap. It's fast. Um, so it takes about an hour to get results. Um, and you and uh, DWR has recently developed with UC Davis uh, a way to ID salmon run. Um, so this is going to be a, a, a technique that we're probably going to rely on uh, more and more in the future, and it's probably the most uh, of most immediate use. So that's what that's why I kind of want to highlight highlight that here. And the papers are there on the bottom left um, if you want to kind of check it out. All right, so how do we evaluate, evaluate our actions? So there are three timescales that I'm thinking of. Um, so there's one in real time where we meet on a weekly basis uh, at the end of the season, where we kind of try to see what happens at the end of the OMR management season. And then there's kind of the multi-year decadal scale almost uh, in terms of like long-term planning. So in real time, so during the OMR management season that Brian and Brian talked about from January to June, uh, for the most part, um, we have these monitoring teams. Uh, we look at uh, salvage data, what's happening in the monitoring in the Delta. We use expert opinion uh, and modeling tools. Uh, in terms of time, you know, just thinking about time, I'm going to kind of skip over this uh, because we've already kind of gone over it. But those are the links where you can pass, uh, look at past um, uh, assessment and outlook documents uh, for at least the past three years, I believe. Now, once the June hits and we're sort of done with the OMR management season, uh, we do have seasonal reports that Reclamation and DWR put together, trying to summarize what has happened uh, throughout the course of this uh, half year or so, or for the water year. Uh, we usually evaluate that by looking at what, what does the lost numbers look like, uh, whether we've exceeded some of these triggers. Um, and often, again, we try to kind of uh, frame it in terms of the population size rather than just well, this is how many we saw at salvage. But again, that's only mean that type of information is really only available for winter run. Now for long-term planning uh, in terms of multi-year scale, uh, of course, we wanna put this in the context of what it's doing for population trajectory. Uh, so we briefly touched upon life cycle models yesterday. So this is where we try to kind of put OMR management in context of like what it's doing in terms of population growth. So we tried out for Delta Smelt. Um, these are kind of the two that's uh, been the most available and easiest to kind of implement with calcium. So there's the Delta Smelt lifecycle model that uh, Fish and Wild Service and Matt Nobriga sitting in the back have worked on, uh, the LCME. There's the Monder Driesel model from a publication from 2011. And then for uh, Salmonids or uh, Chinook Salmon, really, uh, we have uh, the CVPIA science integration team decision support model, and that was developed uh, primarily by Jim Peterson at USGS. Uh, I just want to mention that this is these are the ones that, you know, like I kind of put down here, but there are others. It's not an exhaustive list. There are others that you can probably find. Um, so I, I encourage you to kind of uh, reach out to the interested parties to see what other uh, models that they would like to rely on more in the future. Okay. 
Uh, and lastly, I kind of want to go over some key uh, uncertainties surrounding OMR management. Uh, I just want to firstly note that these are our opinions. Uh, I want to kind of suggest that the panel reach out to all the parties that have participated in the meeting so far to understand what they view are as uh, key uncertainties and the biggest science questions. Uh, and, you know, like implicit in all this, um, there are kind of water costs, economic costs associated with all the actions. So just keep that in mind as I'm focusing on just kind of the fish. Uh, so for Wooden Run Chinook Salmon, uh, we do have a JPE, um, but the target uh, was kind of, again, set based on kind of the greatest annual loss that we've seen over the past decade or so. Um, it's unclear whether or not that's a meaningful number, so it'd be, uh, it'd be good to hear from you all about what is the right target uh, for the percentage of JPE that we should be concerned about. Uh, for Spring Run, you know, of, of course, we don't know how many are entering the Delta as well, um, you know, similar to winter run in terms of like, what is the proper target once we develop that with the monitoring that we have. Uh, for Central Valley Steelhead, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of unknowns. So we don't know how many juvenile steelhead are entering the Delta, proportion they're coming from each basin, what is driving anadromy. Um, and of course, uh, ultimately, what, what is Omar management doing to the population? Is it really harming the population um, or not? Uh, I'd say for Delta smelt, personally speaking, I feel like we have somewhat established kind of like how Omar impacts the population, uh, but there are also a lot of unknowns still. Uh, we don't know how well environmental surrogates uh, represent uh, Delta smelt and behavior and movement. Um, we don't have a whole lot of them uh, right now to kind of be able to understand um, their large-scale movement patterns. Uh, and of course, uh, as, as Lenny mentioned yesterday, you know, we don't know how different these hatchery fish behave from wild fish. And for long fin smelt, um, of course, we just kind of want to generally know what, what is the role of OMR management in the long fin smelt life cycle, um, which you can kind of click on the long fin smelt science plan to kind of understand what the agencies have kind of thought about so far in terms of uh, next steps. Uh, and that is the last slide I Hopefully, we have time for questions. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kat. Uh, perhaps we could have all of the presenters come up and sit at the front, and we'll engage in the discussion. Just about all connected, and uh, which way round should we go here? Pat, should we start with you in the sure. corner? Uh, oh, yes. Thank you guys for our presentation. Uh, uh, so um, uh, there's been a number of uh, statements about triggers, and I understand that uh, triggers can be turbidity, salinity, all these kinds of things. I'm personally interested in the fish triggers. Um, so uh, it, it, to me, as a I'm struggling a little bit to try to fully understand this. So to me, it sounds like uh, if the fish density sort of increases at a certain point, point that results in a trigger where the flow is modified. Is that, is that correct? More or less. And uh, and these uh, triggers will vary depending on the total population size of the fish in the system. Depending on the species. Yeah. Okay. On species. So if we're talking about delta smell, let's say, then if the uh, number of fish that are that particular year goes up, uh, is there greater flexibility in terms of the flow so you can let, let more flow out because there's more fish, and so the, the overall percentage of mortality will be less? I mean, that hasn't happened in the past, but I'll let Brian Schreier speak to that. So for Delta smelt, we've moved away from uh, responding to direct fish measurements and moved to those environmental surrogates. And that was primarily in response to uh, reduced 
abundance of Delta Smell. And now with supplementation, we still have a lot of unknowns in how management uh, uh, is going to be able to, OMAR management is, is going to be able to respond and, and what our tools for wild smelt would be, uh, how effective they would be for those released fish. Uh, notably, now we this year have had, I think, 56 uh, to date uh, salvaged Delta smelt, uh, all released fish from this year's releases. Um, the turbidity uh, surrogate that we referenced has not been triggered this entire year. So there has been clear water present in the Omar corridor this entire time, yet we've seen these fish show up at salvage. Under our old conceptual model, we would not have expected that. So as we move forward, we're gonna to have to uh, presumably be reevaluating the effectiveness of those in light of these released fish. It's for adult fish? Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah, they were, they were marked, so we know that they were released, yeah. As a, as a follow up, then uh, the environmental proxies are used because you didn't really see the fish. Yeah, we had uh, from uh, 2015, 2016 up until we started releasing fish, it wasn't literally zero, but we had virtually zero detections. Uh, so our previous uh, metrics looking at presence in certain areas, uh, catch density, salvage triggers, things like that. Um, were not, we all those were zero. So it was hard to have OMR management, but we knew the fish was still present. They were not extinct. Um, so we developed these environmental surrogates so that we had an ability to manage effectively to their habitat. Um, yeah. Okay. And the, uh, is this affected about by uh, where the, where the stocked fish are being stocked? Um, so OMR management is not responsive to where we're releasing fish. Where we're releasing fish is uh, influenced by a number of things, um, one of which is not releasing them in a place that's right near OMR <laughs> corridor, obviously, because we uh, acknowledge that that's not a great place for them to be. Uh, yet we're finding that regardless of where we release these fish, we're observing that they're Dis, uh, dispersing from that area and uh, for factors that we have maybe some conceptual models, but no uh, real good evidence, there are fish that are moving from those areas of release to areas of entrainment and are showing up in salvage. And that is going to be a component uh, of the supplementation program uh, currently and going forward is trying to understand those dynamics. But we would expect that as supplementation releases presumably are successful, build the population, we have more delta smell present in the estuary, we are going to see them. We would expect to see them uh, in the Omar corridor as well, because that is within their native range. So final, final comment you have to respond to. I mean, couldn't you just increase the number of fish being stocked to uh, the amount being lost? Well, in that is what we're basically doing, yes. <laughs> so the uh, the ex three years of experimental release that we've done, um, I forget who said this, but we were somewhere just shy of 200,000 fish total over those three years that have been stocked. Um, as we move forward, we have uh, what I would say are, are fairly aggressive targets to ramp that up uh, to um, hundreds of thousands of fish per year being, okay. being stocked. Okay. Um, those numbers are based on uh, in, um, outputs from the life cycle model that's been uh, referenced, Fish and Wildlife Service life cycle model. So it's not directly tied to losses from OMR entrainment, um, but those numbers are being, yeah, it's kind of indirectly in a part of that. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, then we go to Jared and then work our way back around the room. I had one just sort of more clarification uh, question and then a, a bigger comment. So you brushed over relatively quickly. This is Brian three blue shirt, Brian. Um, that with steelhead, there's lots of things that are unknown, and that you kind of use as a threshold, the highest something between 2010 and 2018. Could you clarify that? Yeah, so it's the highest annual loss that we've seen. I believe from 2010 to 2018. I would check back the document for the specifics, and then I think they take the 90 percent of that. 
And that's what we're trying to kind of avoid is to exceed that threshold. Interesting. Um, and so then it seems like you're putting a lot of time, effort, and money into making sure that you don't protect the wrong run of salmon. Could it be better to take all that money and effort and just say if a salmon shows up, a salmon is a salmon is a salmon. If you do something good for a non-endangered salmon, it's also going to be good for an endangered salmon. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I can answer that fully. I mean, I think that's above my pay grade. Um, yeah. Yeah, where's, uh, where's Dave and, and Lenny? <laughs> yeah, I can speak mainly to the science in terms of kind of the policy costs and what is set in the regulations. Uh, I'll leave that to the managers that you can probably reach out to directly. Where are we going next? Oh, should we go to Tajara next and then back to the knees? Thank you. So, um, the is it turned on here? Oh, no. oh, sorry. Oh. Um, the data that you seem to be relying on you know, triggers the turbidity and flow data and salvage numbers is um, 15 years old. Um, clearly, populations have changed, uh, restoration has occurred. Have you know have those uh, numbers been updated? Uh, is it worth considering that? Same question. And updating the numbers in terms of yeah, the relation between you know that you showed the Kimmer I think uh, paper I think that's what that's salvage. Uh, on the y-axis and uh, turbidity and flow and something else on the x-axis. So, I mean, that's, you know, and you said there's a uh, inflection point at 5,000 CFS. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you're managing the 5,000 and that there's a relation between turbidity and flow uh, as you would expect. Um, and so I'm just wondering if those relations which you're managing to are still applicable given changes in fish population, changes in, you know, uh, area, marsh, restored marsh, uh, other physical changes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is a good question. I think for Salmanis that hasn't really been revisited as much. I think it's, you know, the the figures, I think that was in Brian Schreier's presentation. Uh, I believe those figures primarily exist in some of these regulatory documents for a specific uh, yeah, analysis that was just done for that purpose and not in actual peer reviewed publications, but folks can correct me if I'm wrong. So I think like in terms of turbidity too, hasn't been directly linked to salmonids. Uh, I think that's more of a kind of a smell uh, relationship. Yeah, so um, you're referring to the, like I showed Grimaldo et al. 20, 2009. Yeah. yeah. So um, those relationships are uh, supported by later publications, notably the Fish and Wildlife Service lifecycle model. Their assessment of entrainment uh, uh, supported the, the previous OMR management structure. Uh, that also highlighted the relationship of uh, water clarity with uh, presence and entrainment risk. Um, so from the perspective of uh, OMR flows, I think we have a pretty good idea, especially with Delta Smelt on OMR flows and what flows are associated. And we're not uh, seeing any evidence yet, I guess I would say that we need to reevaluate that, um, the flow responses anyways. Um, the turbidity responses that I highlighted, I know this is my personal opinion. It seems like the early indications are that some of these released fish that were raised in a hatchery under uh, lower turbidity conditions seem less impeded by the presence of low turbidity water in the OMR corridor and thus are showing up at salvage. We will need a lot more information, a lot more years of releases and, uh, and detections at salvage to be able to articulately model that and determine whether we need to reevaluate the validity of those surrogates. Those triggers are independent. They're operated independently. Turbidity and flow. 
So, um, okay, so we didn't get into a lot of the details. When we refer to, uh, we have a turbidity trigger and we have a secchi trigger, which you know, we can get into why that is. Uh, the turbidity trigger is for adult delta smelt. That is uh, a station, Old River at Bacon Island. It's kind of midway down Old River uh, where we have a water quality instrument that's measuring every 15 minutes, measuring turbidity. Uh, when turbidity at that station daily average gets above 12 FNU, um, which is a threshold that's been established, that was also established in that Grimaldo et al. 2009 paper. Um, when we have turbidity uh, elevated above 12 at that station, uh, we then have an OMR response. So we reduce exports so that we manage to an OMR of negative 2000 CFS. Uh, then the idea is that we keep uh, with that reduced export rate, we stop the movement of that turbid water further south with the goal of trying to prevent the creation of a full turbidity bridge of at least 12 FNU water all the way from the lower Sa Sa uh, San Joaquin River to the export facilities themselves. That hopefully that makes a little sense. Thank you. Let's go to Denise, and then we'll go to the corner and then back to Renee. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, my, my question is probably a little similar to Jared's, but, um, but one of the things that um, the National Academy Committee back in 2010 said about the OMR action was that conceptually the idea of, of you know, uh, making flows less negative in the area was sound. And the, the question was, how much more positive should it be, right? And so you showed, um, I'm pointing at you because I can't distinguish orange shirt there. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, the, it's, it's, you, had the, you had the slide with um, the Grimaldo et al. Um, you know, there's probably, I don't know, 10 dots on that curve. Oh, look at the point of inflection, right? Which I've never been able to see the point of inflection. But you put the arrow on, I think this is kind of your point. And then, um, and you know, I'm trying to do CFS and Humix in my head, which is not particularly good. But then, uh, other Brian showed the um, the results of the life cycle model and the relationships with humidity, and they don't they seem to be continuous curves to me. I don't see a not, there's no hockey stick there, right? Yeah. So how do we tell how much more positive we should make them, and where's the science kind of behind? how uh, restrictive we should be, should it be five, should it be 2,500, should it be 3,500? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, you yeah. yeah, you should know. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's the challenge that we that these teams are having to deal with. And I think in my kind of most, I don't wanna say flippant response, but in my most uh, unvarnished response, a lot of that comes down to a, a policy call of how we balance water supply with species protection. And, uh, you know, really that's not something that a, a team of biologists is going to be able to really speak articulately to, because we do have, generally speaking, I mentioned, we've got a range of OMRs. They're all negative. They're all associated with some amount of entrainment. Where is that threshold where we uh, have, I guess a colloquially acceptable level of entrainment um, that balances all of this. And that's something that is, uh, well, functionally a discussion that happens a lot at WAMT. Um, case in point, point. Did, with our, point, but yeah, but this is, this is a big part of the challenge and this is where we are um, over time trying to move away from move to some of these more quantitative uh, triggers rather than just having these um, uh, team discussions and expert elicitation kind of processes so that we can at least get into a realm where we're a little bit more consistently applying um, protections and have uh, these decisions be made in a little bit more transparent way. Uh, if I can just do one quick follow up and we don't need to go into it, but is it now that we'll have more conversations about this in uh, future meetings? But um, is, is that issue about where you put that 
point of inflection of what you listen is that a similar kind is that analogous to what percent of the jpe do you manage to take to on on when it run is are those kind of analogous kind yeah of decisions? Okay. yeah yeah because yeah once we sort of hit a certain percentage of the jpe then we take an action yeah. where we reduce pumping to manage omar to a more positive so if, if we were to think about what's the science behind where you put that what's the science behind the the 10 percent or whatever that would be a similar kind of set thank you Right, right. Yeah. And I think, you know, I just want to know that, like, yeah, I think that's what we're hoping the panel can help us out with. Um, you know, I think, you know, like one thing to keep in mind, right, like you've heard from all these parties that have a, you know, a stake on the CVP and the SWP, um, that there is kind of like a cost to all these actions and finding the right balance and kind of the best inflection points to target and what and like how it impacts the population and how can we achieve recovery for the species while maintaining water delivery is kind of like what we're hoping to kind of achieve uh, from this panel, or what we're, we're hoping to get from this panel. Great, so Steve, Jerry, and then across to Renee. Okay, okay, I just have a, two simple questions. One, uh, salmon or one smell. The salmon question is, is a process you're using to me seem perfectly straightforward. You need a good estimate of production, and you got an estimate of what you're salvaging, and you're trying to just uh, calculate what your impact will be as soon period. Very straightforward and so forth. So, for, um, so the question is, what is your um, daily variability in, in, uh, in training? Do you get big pulses? Is it how often can you, how quickly can you respond to it? So, uh, pulses? And there is somewhat variable day to day. Is there any um, correlation with environmental variables? Just after a rainfall, you get a big pulse or anything like that? Yeah, this was specifically for, for salmon, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think in terms of the data from what I've seen so far and from studies, you know, I think there's going to be a pretty good autocorrelation. So I think when you get big um, number of fish from one day, it's probably, you're probably going to see quite a few fish, um, like similar numbers for at least a week generally. Um, and of course, they're going to be correlated with uh, a lot of things that's happening in the system, right? Like how much, uh, what's Omar? How much are we exporting out of the system? Uh, what is the what does the flow look like uh, in addition to the number of fish that just that are just coming in? Um, so generally speaking, based on telemetry studies that's been done so far, which I think have been linked in previous presentations as well, uh, we understand that flow uh, higher inflow into the delta increased survival uh, for salmonids. Um, and at the same time that you've heard that there's a lot of steelhead that we're salvaging at the facilities at the moment, now we're also seeing that some of the modeling uh, that's been done by USGS uh, are indicating that we're having higher survival, like almost 0 0.8, 0 0.9 survival for uh, winter unestimated uh, at the moment. Uh. You know, the, the smell question is a little more challenging, I think, because it doesn't seem like you have a way you can test whether or not your changes in flow have any effect at all because you're, you don't have a measure of the smell system and you don't have a measure of a, uh, a, a proportion of smell for your training. You're getting five or six in a year. Natural is sort of like claim success, or, although that could be 100% of the population. You don't know. And uh, so uh, I'm wondering, uh, and you've given the research results, you said like uh, turbidity was low, but you got 50 some this year already, which is kind of high. Uh, when do you start to changing those uh, parameters, okay, how would you, what would you even use? Is 56 by, what if you got a thousand tomorrow? Uh, low turbidity. I mean, when if you're using environmental uh, surrogates and, and uh, I'm just uh, wondering how you ever relate that back to, uh, I don't think there's an answer because if you don't, what is your measure of success or failure in terms of low turbidity itself? So quite a few things there. Um, so I would say, first off, for for the turbidity surrogate, um, we have a lot of uh, publications that there's very good acceptance of that uh, that as a surrogate. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, uh, instances over the last, since 2008, where we've uh, had turbidity uh, greater than 12 NTU show up and, and connect that turbidity bridge at the facilities. And within 24 hours, 48 hours, we're seeing Delta smelt at salvage. So we have, uh, and in the life cycle mod, we've got a lot of different uh, 
avenues of support for the validity of that as a good surrogate for smell presence. The wild card in that how uh, weather and how um, released fish are going to, how that surrogacy is going to be applicable to them is something that we need to evaluate. We haven't had enough time, I would say, to have the information to be able to speak to that articulately. I would say that, you know, we 56 compared to, uh, unpack that. So we have through the life cycle model, fish model service life cycle model, we have estimates of abundance and that's based on catch. That's the enhanced Delta smelt monitoring program. Uh, we get weekly updates when they catch fish of abundance estimates. Um, and we know how many fish we're putting out into the system every year through the releases. Uh, so when we have 56, like that's a high number relative to the last 10 years of Delta smelt uh, salvage, but acknowledging that we released almost 100,000 fish into the system this year and only 56 of them showed up. Now, obviously those 56 are likely indicative of possibly much greater presence uh, in the Omar corridor, we don't know. Um, but relative to the fact that we put in 100,000 fish, plus we may have had likely had survival of some offspring of fish released in previous years, um, that uh, the problem really just comes in, you know, how robust are our estimates for that overall population? We know how many fish we're putting in in a given year, but <laughs> survival through the summer and fall is low enough that we don't have good detections during those periods to understand how many fish are left over from the previous year. Uh, so quantifying that um, that level of impact that salvage represents is, is very challenging. Okay, just a minor question. You said you weren't catching any uh, smelt in the regular smelt survey, but then you had the enhanced smelt survey, and we're starting to catch some. What do you mean yeah. getting enhanced? Uh, well, like I in the plot, you see that they're mostly hatchery fish, but um, I think this year. There's been 30 something fish in the enhanced Delta smell survey. So Brian's um, 50, what was it? 56 or 54 is like an expanded number of the number that were counted in salvage. So I think there were like 14 counted in salvage, which um, were expanded to 56 based on like their subsampling. Um, and then the number in EDSM was, yeah, I think it's 30 something because we have 40, two total, if I'm remembering. Um, so yeah, I, I'm i not sure what the detections were like before supplementation started for EDSM. Do you remember what numbers were like then? There was a couple of years where we had zero across the board, um, triggering like, you know, I think Pierre Moyle's paper on, you know, the question about functional extinction and things like that. Um, but even in, with our releases, you know, mentioned releasing 100,000 fish, let's say what less than 100 of those fish ever get detected again in monitoring or salvage, you know, that's still, you know, drop in the bucket, right? So that's where ramping up releases is, is part of that conversation, which we can get a point where we can have more reliable detections. Yeah, we've also been, no oh, sorry. we've also been noticing um, that detections really ramp up at least this year and last year when first flush occurred. Um, so yeah, we were having really low detections up until the storm start, started coming in and the flow started going. That might be partly because um, of the spawning migration and they're moving, but it's been interesting to see that pattern both years. Great, thanks, sir. If we can go to Jerry, we're going to squeeze in two more questions. We did start a little late, so we'll spend to run five minutes into the, into the break, but uh, we go to Jerry and then Renee will give you the last question, and then I know there's a lot of other questions around the table, but we could pick those up uh, perhaps during the break with the panelists. So uh, restrictions uh, on the corridor uh, affect your ability to get water to the, the pumps. Are you able to deliver all the water that you, you want to deliver? Are these restrictions actually hurting the water management side of things? Um, yes. Uh, compared to absent the regulations, um, just in, I'm trying to remember the number off the top of my head, but I believe it was around 300,000 acre feet of water. It wasn't delivered compared to F, we were just operating to D1641. 
three hundred and forty thousand. And to that effect, uh, state water project allocation came out a week or two ago. We're only allocating fifteen percent to our contractors, uh, so fifteen percent of their requested amount. So, a, a pretty significant chunk of that water. So yes, we, the contractors are receiving much less water than they would like, and that influences the decisions on how they use the water. So um, water from the Sacramento, did it end up being stored or did it go out to the, the bay? Uh, it would have gone to increased outflow. The yeah. bay? So yeah. Okay. And how do you split, when you pump water out for the, to go south, how do you split it between the state and the federal water projects? Uh, we have an agreement between us projects, uh, uh, the, what's called the Coordinated Operations Agreement. Um, when we're restricted by something like OMR, which restricts uh, fully on our export restrictions, not it doesn't, our upstream reservoir releases they don't play a part of it. Uh, but so when we have an export restriction, I always split that 60% for the Bureau and 40% for the SWP. Um, appreciate the stamina. Yeah. y'all. So yesterday, Chandra with the state water contractors was mentioning a desire for dynamic thresholds, which makes a ton of sense to me conceptually. And I've been thinking about how would that work for salmon, um, being a salmon centric being. And, uh, I feel like I noticed you didn't mention the NOAA life cycle model in your list of models, which seemed like sort of a glaring omission to me. And, uh, and I feel like a dynamic threshold would need a life cycle awareness because like you'd want a number that was actually sensitive to how those juveniles were contributing to cohort replacement rate and not just for a given, you know, suite of adults and out migrant cohort, but based on the sequence of years and how the cohorts had fared in previous years, um, which seems like a totally doable thing to Stephen's point, given what we know about winter run and the math. And so I just, I was curious if you all had all had contemplated something like that at all and the application of that model or the CBPIA model for that matter um, to doing that. That's one question since I'm last. I'll just throw out the other one too, because the other one's just sort of a, a naive, fun one. But you also mentioned misidentification challenges between the runs. And you know, we heard a bunch yesterday about like the maybe panic is too strong a word, but the concern over the number of steelhead that are showing up at the pumps right now. And I'm like, are we sure that they're steelhead? Like I've looked at a lot of juvenile salmonids and a, a a small steelhead could be misidentified for a small chinook, depending. So maybe that's on totally on lockdown, but it was just like a silly question that I wonder. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll try to go backwards. Uh, so in terms of the steelhead, they're mostly showing up at around 200 to 250 millimeters fork length, so they're sizable. Uh, we did have, we did receive genetic information back from our genesis. You know, a few were turned out to be steelhead because they were kind of running salmon uh, for. For genetic analysis and a few of them end up becoming steelhead um and in terms of uh the okay so going back to the life cycle model yes so the, so that's a model that certainly exists i think steve lindley mentioned uh, in terms of kind of the the nymphs life cycle model uh, i just kind of listed the ones that were accessible to uh, our division and reclamation most recently uh, as part of kind of uh the, the long-term operations plan that we're trying to kind of model some of these uh, different alternatives uh or for the next uh, biological opinion. Um, so yeah, I, I would reach out to NIMS, uh, for and Steve Lindley and Noble Hendricks and folks who have kind of work, been working on, uh, on that model about you know, what the model looks like. But as far as I know, the publication hasn't been out yet. Correct? So, but have you, thank you, and I, I work with those guys a lot, have you thought about, independent of which model you use, a life cycle approach to a dynamic target? It's like, oh, if we, you know, this is how this number, in the case of a really small population number, is contributing to cohort replacement rate for this cohort. And this is like 
the second bad year in a row or the third bad year in a row, or it's not, or we just had a whole bunch of wet years. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that's a good idea and concept. I think, of course, it has to be kind of uh, in line with kind of what is feasible uh, with the water projects. I mean, I think Brian would have like a bit more input in terms of kind of what is the proper lag time, like how quickly uh, can we react to kind of those th different things? How does it impact kind of like the water delivery later down the line for the season? So I'm not so sure about that. I mean, but I think in terms of like fish perspective, I think that seems like a good idea. And I do want to note in, in with regards to kind of uh, how simple uh, the, the management for salmon is, I just want to note that, you know, I think I wouldn't characterize it as simple, I guess, from my perspective, because, you know, there might be some that say that the JPE is too high. Some might say that JPE is too low. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding that, right? Um, it's also kind of the, our, our best guess as to what's coming into the Delta. But I mentioned survival in the Delta also matters, right? So there might be when higher survival occurs, we might be seeing more at salvage facility and vice versa. So I just kind of want to note that. Um, but yeah, I think it, a more dynamic threshold might make sense. Um, and I think that's something that we should potentially explore. And yeah, we'd look forward to hearing more recommendations uh, such as that from the panel. Sure. Thank you, Brian. And with that, we have to bring this session to at your close. I'd like to just make two points. For those of you who weren't in the first meeting when we heard about the National Academy process, the committee members are invited to ask probing questions, and often it doesn't represent their personal uh, opinions or, or views. It, they're just trying to get the information out. So I wanted to emphasize that, but I'd also like to thank all of you. We know you under many other pressures at the moment and the time to put these coordinated presentations together and to uh, give such detailed responses to those questions is very much appreciated. It certainly makes our work a lot easier. So let's give the panelists a round. Okay, if we could get started again, please. And if, if folks would like to take their seats. Every time Okay, I think you have break up the great conversation, but if we could find our seats and we'll get started. So the difference between and I'll do that. I'm gonna pass around the thing. So you're gonna pass around the signage. Yeah. Well, thanks. Perhaps uh, everyone could find their seats and we'll get going again. Uh, two points of business. Um, just for our records, there'll be a sign-up sheet going uh, around the back. Uh, please add, add your name to that, just so we have a record of participants. O also in the back, there's a sign-up for the open mic session this afternoon, uh, just so we can ensure that everyone gets uh, adequate time. So if you wish to speak to the committee this afternoon, please sign up at the back or send an email to Maya uh, at um, M3. M3. Yeah. Yeah. At NAS. Perfect. OK, in this session, um, we have an additional speaker to our lineup, Kanran Koizimi from the uh, US Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, he's an expert in the calcium and where he's worked for the past four years. And most recently, he's worked closely with DWR colleagues to develop an updated Old and Middle River management logic for the current LTO process. So, Cameron, welcome. 
I know who's first up. Go ahead. And this is, of course, focusing on the modeling. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome, Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to start off talking a bit about data we collect in for operations, uh, how that influences kind of the inputs for modeling uh, going forward, and starting off starting, uh, talking about particle tracking and kind of how that's used uh, for risk and treatment. Uh, risk and treatment. All right. So as mentioned earlier, we produce this weekly during the um, period of interest, so um, in November through June. Uh, we produce a weekly operations outlook that is provided to the two technical teams uh, and to want. Um, but it's basically our best guess at how operations will go over this next week, um, depending on what regulations are affecting us. Um, so primarily it's uh, trying to come up with our best estimate of what free port flow is going to be, what for now flow is going to be. Uh, what alpha, the resulting outflow is, what we think OMR will be, and we provide this to the fish agencies uh, for others, not the public. Uh, but yeah, it's used to inform the risk assessments um, and to come up with things. Um, so first we look at the precipitation forecast. Uh, CNRFC has a great tool for this. Uh, I can break it down to six hour increments. Um, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes has a good long range kind of probability of something will happen. That's not great detail on what, how much that would actually be, but it's come online in the last couple of years and it's been a great help. Um, but as ENRC is kind of where we deal with a lot of our forecasts. Uh, from that precipitation, they then take it down into flow forecasts at various boundary conditions. Uh, there's just in particular as uh, Verona is the furthest down on the Sacramento. So you still need to incorporate in the American river flows um, and anything downstream. Uh, Vernalis on the south end, which is primary, a primary focus for when we're talking about OMR management. Uh, they produce a five day out forecast, a deterministic, deterministic forecast. Uh, they do have ensemble products that go about 10 days. Um, but even with the best information they have, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, the second plot over, plot over here, you can kind of see the um, green was their forecast for that particular date. Uh, I think this was February 20th, but um, after it was all said and done, uh, they were a thousand off on the tail end and 500 or so off at the peak, uh, which can be a lot. Um, most of this on the tail end, I will say is because the CNRC takes into account um, the precipitation and the runoff from the precipitation and known reservoir releases. Uh, so if a reservoir decides to change the release pattern from when they do the forecast, that's gonna drive a lot of that big differences at the end uh, in that particular case. Um, but so we tried to develop scenarios uh, based on all this information. Uh, the key question is, what effect will a change in the OMR operation have on entrainment risk? We try to develop these scenarios. So if it's going to be a high San Joaquin flow, this is the OMR we think it will be. This is going to be a low San Joaquin flow. This is where we think OMR will be. But how would export, what exports need to be to hit these different OMR objectives um, and potentially different scenarios of different OMR objectives? Uh, but these kind of form the basis for what a lot of the shorter term models that uh, we'll talk about are based off of, uh, particularly PTM and uh, the human model. Um, yeah. So uh, we're going to particle tracking model. So the version we use is uses DSM-2 as a hydrodynamic base. Uh, DSM-2, that's a model built by DWR. Um, but it has a lot of applications. It also has a water quality module that is used for other aspects. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a one-dimensional model. 
but out of it, we can get a decent uh, estimates for velocity, depth, uh, um, flow. It uh, takes into account uh, a lot of the structures in the delta and how we think they'll behave. Um, but um, typically for a PTM run, we'll do a three week forecast. As I mentioned, CNRFC only really goes out five days. Uh, so we just kind of have to make our best possible guess as things go forward. A lot of that tends to be a steady state kind of assumption, uh, but it will depend on if we think that's a storm peak happening now, it's, then we have to make an estimate of where we think that baseline flow will be afterwards. Um, but first hydro is run and that serves as the base input into the, what's called the particle tracking module. Um, that's a quad is quasi 3D simulated model for new, neutrally buoyant particles, basically assuming the thing just floats along wherever it's going. And you try to see where it's going to end up. Um, it tries to separate out the particle in the depth and the width of the channel, but inherently hydro is a one dimensional model, but that can influence how a particle will behave at a junction in a river um, between nodes. Uh, the additional inputs we need to give PTM beyond the assumption we put into the hydro model, uh, we need to choose where we want these particles to inject, tend to inject about 10,000 or so. We try to dump a lot in so we can get some statistics on where they go. Uh, but we choose an injection date, how long we want to inject them. Typically, we just have them spread out evenly over the course of a day. Uh, but those are all decision points. And then, of course, where you want to see the model output um, to be. In particular, the model part we look for in this is the flux past certain points. And we try to break it into distinct chunks where there's not too many paths that the water could take around those points. Um, but uh, we look at how much goes past chips, so how many particles we think are going out towards the ocean, uh, how many are going down the Old Mineral River corridors uh, by those two primary paths, and then also how many have made it to the export facilities, kind of assess what's the risk of these particles and train in the older corridor or further south. Um, the directionality of flux, it tends to go with the natural uh, direction of flow for those rivers. Uh, so negative flux will be down the old river corridor or up inwards. Um, but basically it's looking at the net number of particles that pass by that location. So particles can go back and forth, back and forth, but only count them the last time it goes through in the daily averages. But as I mentioned, uh, these are only neutrally buoyant particles. So we try not to use this when we're talking about anything that tries to swim, uh, which um, so salmon are pretty much out of the course and adult smelt. Uh, we really don't try to treat those as neutrally buoyant particles. So it is really for juvenile and larval uh, delta and lungfin smelt that we try to use this to try to help influence uh, our risk assessments. Um, output ends up looking like this, where you see the flux past a particular point in a different a particular scenario, and you can see it over the course of time. Uh, tables will just break down. Um, at particular points in time, what percentage has gone past. Uh, but the idea is to compare between different scenarios of, hey, this chunk that was released at this point in time from this location, it reached this point this fast, and how, many, how does that change over time? Um, still, it's... Uh, the thought process on how that influences and how much we relate it to delta smelt or long fin smelt, uh, but it is a point of evidence that is looked at uh, in our risk, assess risk assessments. Um, that's all I have for particle tracking. If you want to, uh, let's see. Uh, we got someone else to get to the other presentation. No, jumping up obviously. So 
So I'm going to be talking about uh, the OMR representation in calcium. Um, so before we get into how OMR is represented, we can talk about what calcium is. Um, so the calcium is a planning model. Um, and besides the mass balance part uh, between nodes and arcs, um, calcium is not a physical model. Uh, what we're really modeling is operational decisions uh, bounded by regulatory requirements and deliveries that uh, have to be made. Um, we do this using linear optimization and weights on, on those dis different decisions. Um, a normal calcium three study is a hundred year period. It's a monthly time step. And we're generally using the historical hydro hydrology or um, some version of climate adjusted hydro hydrology. Here we have an example of uh, the calcium schematic. It's calcium three is very large. Um, so you can't really read the different uh, arcs and nodes, but labeled Sacramento, San Joaquin, Delta Outflow, and then here's our Old and Middle River, and then the pumping plants that are pulling water out of, or near the Old and Middle River. So the challenges in uh, modeling OMR and calcium, uh, first, a lot of the OMR actions are real-time adjustments, and we're working with a monthly time step in cal calcium. Um, a lot of the triggers for the OMR actions are based on fish presence, fish salvage, temperature. Uh, we can't really represent any of these things in the model itself. Uh, so we have to find some way to either correlate uh, to something we can model in calcium, such as flow. Um, and then we, we're working with a limited historical time, uh, data set to make those correlations. Um, this graph up here is the number of winter run salvage from 2000 to 2020. So uh, after 2000, after the 2009 biops, uh, we saw much less uh, winter run salvage. And so, and that was, um, had a lot to do with the difference in operations. Um, so when we were going back and looking at the uh, historical data set, we looked at the data after 2010. Um, even within that 2010 to 2021 period, there are a lot of holes in that data set. And then finally, uh, the regulatory language can be left open-ended uh, for uh, operational flexibility. I have an example here of the turbidity bridge avoidance off-ramp, um, where Reclamation DWR may determine that OMR restrictions to manage turbidity are infeasible and will instead implement an OMR target that is deemed protective based on turbidity adult delta smelt distribution and salvage. Um, this kind of open-ended regulation is hard to model in calcium. So using the 2019 biops as the example, um, here's a collection of the OMR actions, and we really looked at three different categories of the actions, ones that we could correlate to the flow, uh, ones that we could look at the historical timing to determine when it would trigger, and uh, looking at the historical triggers and then using uh, categorical uh, averages of that historical record. Um, in all of these, we first attempted to correlate uh, the either the triggers or the off ramp to uh, flow because that's something that we could dynamically model in calcium. Um, we could look at the flows that were happening in calcium and then respond accordingly. Um, a lot of the actions that we were able to model that way um, have either flow or turbidity triggers to begin with. Um, so those examples are first flush, onset of OMR, uh, turbidity bridge avoidance, and storm flags. The next set, the historical timing, um, these tended to be more temperature-based ones where we could look at the historical record and see that around this time is uh, when we hit those temperature targets. Uh, in a climate-adjusted hydrology, we would do the same thing, but with the new climate in mind. Um, and these would be uh, onset of OMR, end of OMR, and then the 
turbidity bridge off ramp. And then finally, the historical triggers. Um, this was the most difficult group to model. It, it tended to relate to fish behavior. Um, so these were the larval and juvenile delta smelt action, salmonid cumulative loss threshold, and the single year loss threshold. And I'll get more into that later. So for each one of these groups, uh, let's talk about an example of how we implemented it in Calcin. So for first flush, the trigger is a running three-day average um, of 25,000 CFS at Freeport and 50 NTU or greater at, uh, at Freeport as well. This is looking at data between 2010 and 2021. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the number of days that would have triggered first flush within the normal period, which is December or and or January, or January. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have a monthly average of the unimpaired uh, river runoff. So we drew a line at the 20,000 CFS for a monthly average and decided that if we had a larger than 20,000 CFS uh, Sacramento River runoff index, then first flush would be triggered in that time step. And that was in either uh, December or January. Example of historical timing for end of OMAR management for salmonids. Um, we have both 95% uh, of salmonids have migrated past Chips Island or um, se seven days during June uh, where the temperatures at Mossdale ex exceed 71.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we looked at all our time period, 2010 through 2021, um, and found that end of May, usually by the end of May, that uh, one of those triggers will have happened. And so the end of all my management happens at the end of May in the model. Finally, we have the historical triggers for uh, the single year loss threshold for salmonids. Um, and this reduces our has an OMR requirement of negative 3,500 CFS when it is triggered. Um, these are the triggers right here when we hit 50% of any one of those thresholds. Um, and what we ended up doing was uh, looking at that at the historical record from 2010 to 2021 and uh, taking an average by water type of what percentage of the month was covered by the action. Um, and then applied that percentage to each month. So for example, if we were in March during a dry year, 71% um, of that March would be uh, covered by that OMR requirement of negative 3,500. And then the remaining 29% would uh, have an OMR requirement of negative 5,000. Um, just to point out that the count there is the number of years within that 2010 to 2021. Um, no above normal years happened during that period. Um, we ended up taking an average between the below normal and the wet years um, to come up with those percentages. Mm -hmm. Hi again. Uh, so we kind of talked about kind of a more near term and uh, real time kind of operations with Brian and then Cameron kind of went over kind of like how we model things in the long term. Uh, so we're going back again in, in real time operations. Uh, so I just kind of preface this by saying that in an ideal world, I wouldn't be the one giving this presentation. Uh, I'm only involved with the kind of the last uh, item on that list. Um, but these are kind of the biological models that we're using in real time. So that's why we're not really, you, you know, highlighting the life cycle models here. But again, I encourage you to kind of look into those as well. Uh, so the first is this uh, STARS model. Um, let's see what it stands for above there. Uh, these are models developed from acoustic tag studies. Uh, so the telemetry studies that I mentioned in the previous talk. 
Um, and you may also remember about the low survival in the interior delta. Um, so this is kind of a model that tells us, like, uh, gives us a probability about as a fish uh, such as winter run coming down the or coming down the Sacramento River, uh, which junctions are they going to take, and which route they're going to take, and what is kind of the survival probability associated with uh, those routes. Um, so on the top there, you can't really probably read those, but in the red is the delta cross channel. So this is kind of, and it gives you the survival probability there. So in the bottom red there, that's when the delta cross channel uh, gate was open this year. Um, so there's a probability that the fish are gonna enter there uh, and it has low survival probability. Uh, I believe the purple is Georgian S. Lou. Uh, so that's where you saw kind of the, the non-physical barrier that DWR installed this year. Um, and you can kind of see that's also interior delta. So it's a little lower. Um, I believe yellow is Southern Steamboat Slough. So those are kind of the sloughs that are kind of north of Sacramento River and join back on the Sacramento River. Uh, and Sacramento River, uh, I think, is the one that's on top. Uh, so you can kind of track and see how they change over time. I believe low and temperature are kind of the primary drivers in this model. And you can kind of see the, the DCC gate operations and kind of the flow values on the bottom. Uh, so there are kind of two duplicate websites uh, that you can check out. Um, this models are developed by uh, U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, Russ Perry and Dalton Hans uh, are the primary authors. So it's helpful in, uh, uh, for us uh, when we're looking, when we're meeting weekly in the salmon monitoring team uh, to kind of understand what is happening in the system. Okay, so the second model that I'm gonna go over is this, uh, what I'm calling steelhead and winter on loss and salvage predictor. Uh, it's a boosted regression tree models developed by Mike Tillotson at ICF uh, in conjunction with uh, scientists from Metropolitan Water District. Uh, so this is a forecasting model uh, of what we could we think salvage would look like in the following week. Uh, so it pred predicts a loss uh, for winter run and steelhead. Uh, so there are two separate models. That's why you see two figures there. Uh, we have a link on the SACPAS website there that you can click on, um, and you can kind of uh, switch the toggles of all the different predictors to see how that changes uh, what your prediction would be. So, uh, yeah, I think th that's kind of like the thing that I really want to highlight here. So it kind of automatically uh, scrapes kind of the data um, that the water operators like Brian kind of put together, uh, tries to give like what uh, we would predict for the following week. Um, and it's been helpful, you know, at least for this year, uh, because as you, as I've told you, uh, and others have told you, we, we've exceeded uh, our still hold, uh, still had a loss uh, threshold this year. Um, and there are a lot of discussion at the manager's team about like, what is the proper OMR that we should operate to given this fact. Um, so this is one way we can kind of look at the different OMR values and uh, have an expect and uh, understand what the expectations are in terms of loss or steelhead based on those different scenarios. Um, and just like to explain the figure on the right there. So it's a little hard to see, uh, but and once you go to the website, you'll see that there's this kind of gray line uh, in the background uh, and the gray shade. The gray shade is the uh, kind of the confidence interval. And the gray line is kind of the historical rate of salvage for their respective species. Um, so we're in this uh, figure that I kind of uh, screen captured uh, this was uh, something that I kind of uh, captured sometime in early March or late February. Um, so you see it kind of stops in the middle there and the green lines is what the model predicts and the blue line is what's already been observed so far this year. Uh, I guess one thing I wanna highlight is that for winter run, uh, it does predict length at date winter run. Um, so I think there's kind of, as I mentioned, there's been kind of like a push towards uh, looking at genetic winter run instead. Uh, but what this model does is it predicts length of date because that's what we're currently operating to, at least in the current biological opinion. Uh, oh, and I guess I should also mention that like one of the strongest uh, uh, predictor for this model is uh, the previous uh, week's observation in terms of salvage. So it relies heavily upon kind of the observation of what uh, loss looks like in the previous week. Uh, and then it gives us a kind of a number of what to expect next week. Um, so it might be a little weaker in terms of prediction of like when fish starts showing up, uh, because when it's zero, it's not really gonna be as uh, accurate. If the previous week uh, observation is zero. Okay, so the last one I'm gonna, gonna that I'm gonna go over is this, uh, what we're calling the machine learning model for winter run. 
Um, so the primary author and really the, the one who's kind of been driving this project the most is uh, Dr. Jeremy Guida at California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So I recommend that you reach out to him if you have uh, further questions or want to kind of see the draft report that we've put together. So unlike the previous two models, this one is not yet online. Uh, we have uh, not yet published the, the paper yet, but we have distributed um, or at least uh, shared kind of like the, the results and the predictions at a given week uh, in the Salmon Modern teams. So the models is pretty complete. They use this extreme gradient. It's pretty much complete. Um, and finalized. It's an extreme gradient boosting model with dropout additive, additive uh, regression tree. So it is kind of a, a machine learning technique in a sense, although we're not updating it live. Uh, it consists of 30 separate models. So you see kind of those lines are the 30 different models. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a prediction uh, throughout the course of a single uh, water year or OMR management season. Um, the the, it predicts a categorical variable. So instead of like an exact number, like the previous model that I showed you. So the purple is predicting absence. Uh, the light green is predicting low presence or less than 4.29 expanded salvage. That's kind of the median uh, value uh, threshold that we kind of set. And the dark green is the high presence. So if we expect a lot of uh, wintering. Um, I also want to mention that this is also predicted, uh, predicting length that they went around because we did have a stakeholder group uh, that we could regularly reach out to for this uh, project. And this is what they recommended because at the time of uh, when, at the inception of the project, this is what we were managing too. Uh, so for the figure on the left there, it kind of uh, predicts uh, what's gonna happen over the course of uh, from uh, November all the way through January. And you can kind of see that like over time, uh, the model is predicting that uh, we we have declining upper probability of absence and around like January 26 or so it's predicting um, an increase in uh, in uh, low presence uh, and this is so you can see on the top there this is a predicting uh, what would happen the following week so January 27th of 2020 uh, on January 20th so we're predicting one week in advance uh, again for this model and I just want to note that the, the model was not built for uh, data for 2020 um, and that this is kind of like a testing model. Um, and we kind of uh, have pretty good uh, predictive capability uh, based on kind of the testing data set. Uh, I just want to highlight another thing that we can also do um, uh, is to that the, what we are also hoping to produce on a weekly basis is to kind of see how uh, the predictions would change depending on what we change export to. So the dotted line there um, is what the, the export value that was given to us from the water operators uh, for the following week. But with this, we can kind of see like, well, so okay, so we're predicting um, uh, low presence of a winter and length that date because you see that the green line, the uh, light green line is at the top there. But as we change uh, to higher pumping, you can see that we start to increase the probability of high presence, the dark green. Um, and as we uh, go to the lowest export possible, you see that the purple is starting to kind of climb up, suggesting that we're gonna the model is gonna try to predict absence more. Um, so this is kind of like something that you know, like we think could be potentially be helpful in terms of discussing um, what we should do in case we exceed a loss, you know, an annual loss threshold, for example. So, in, and in this case, it might be that the other uh, factors uh, that are included in the model are kind of driving this presence because you can see that the model is not really uh, guaranteeing absence, um, even at the lowest export in this particular instance. Okay, I, I, said, I think I said that, that was the last slide, but I, I remember that there's one thing I kind of want to uh, talk about is this uh, SHAP values. Uh, so I think, Machine learning is kind of like a black box type of model, as some of you are probably aware, um, but we need to kind of, so it's not really a mechanistic uh, model and it's hard to kind of understand uh, what the model's doing and how it's making predictions. So this SHAP value is kind of a way to figure out how the model is making predictions. So how the machine learning model is thinking. Um, and I think this is kind of like, and gonna be useful as we develop more models uh, such as this one. Uh, so what you're seeing here is kind of a time series of predictions from the model. Uh, so the, all the predictive variables for the models are up top there um, and labeled in different colors. 
uh, and what in and on the figure itself is a time series of uh, what's driving the predictions for absence uh, at the particular day. Um, so the predictions itself uh, is in the colored uh, bars. So up top there or on the bottom, uh, tests mean that it's a uh, data that the model has never seen before. Uh, training uh, or train means that it's the the, the model. Uh, it's uh, data that the model is using uh, to create the model. But what's interesting is that you can kind of see that the model in terms of the color, again, green means presence. You can see that uh, winter run is expected to show up uh, between January to May, and that's exactly what the model is doing. Um, so, and when when we're looking at January to April, uh, the models uh, predicting absence. So that's why all these predictors are on the um, negative side. So when it's negative, it's predicting the opposite of absence, and when it's positive, it, the model is predicting uh, absence. So all these kind of things are contributing towards the prediction of presence or the opposite of absence during the January to April months. And it's kind of making those decisions based on uh, those categories up top. And you can kind of see which one has the highest proportion. Um, and as we go towards the summer, the model kind of is really relying on, it's predicting absence and it's really, you can tell that it's really relying on this uh, temperature at Sherwood Harbor or Sacramento River near the city of Sacramento. Uh, and as well as uh, root uh, day of year, which is uh, root DOY to the left hand side there. Um, so it's really, under the model is kind of understands that it's using kind of these seasonal predictors to say that, hey, this is the summer and fall, we're really not gonna expect a lot, any uh, winter run at salvage at all. Um, so yeah, I think that's just one neat thing to kind of highlight uh, and hopefully we can kind of post this uh, model uh, online at some point in the near future. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Jeremy has taken up another position uh, recently, so it's kind of delayed the, kind of the posting of the data set uh, a little bit, or the, the model. All right, and that's all we got. Yeah, well, thank you. That's so, if you'd like to take a seat at the, at the front, and I, were there others? We were, uh, any colleagues that you'd like to bring up to the front too? Well, thank you for those insights to the modeling. And uh, yeah, good to see you. But please, free to have a seat. And see if we have the mic, shall we start with, with Jay and then go to Joe? A little question on the, the last slide that you had. What is RBDDS? Uh, so that's the red bluff diversion dam passage estimate. So how many fish are passing through red bluff? You counted it before they would get down. Yeah, so like the model is using data from six months past, uh, roughly. So in your machine learning uh, the model, you had 30 models running. I'm sure they are very slow running because there are complexities and stuff. And then you use the machine learning to get another model out of it. Are there any physical data going into this uh, typically, or physical data is actually absent? Now, in the weather models, they use the same thing 30, 30 different models. They basically get in and have data ingestion. Do you have that type of thing going on, or it's just based on models only? Uh, so I'm hoping I'm answering the question correctly. But... Relationship, right? What's training is yeah. 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 So what? Yeah. yeah. The training is based on all these predictor variables. In terms of how it's making prediction for the future, it's, it's scraping the data from kind of the information online that the water operators produce, um, so just like the other ones. All all observed data, correct? And training also. So that data again goes for training. Yeah, so oh yeah. So in terms of the model construction, uh we have data I can't exactly remember. I think from the 1990s uh all the way to 2019. And then we split chunks of that time series and leave them out uh for kind of uh, the purpose of training the model. Yeah, 
for oh, cross validation. And then that 30 models are also being used, uh, whatever coming out. Yeah, the 30 models is to kind of reduce the amount of stochasticity that can, you know, because the, depending on the iteration, sometimes it will give a different type of results or models. So we kind of want to account for them. At least that's my basic summary. So far, how is it performed? Are you happy with the performance? Performance measure? I think, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm a little biased because I'm part of the team, but I mean, I think it's been aligning fairly well this year in terms of what is showing up. That's but I saw another one, which is the, oh, the other one, which is the machine learning model is the artificial neural network where they use calcium and uh, ESM too. Uh, that one actually, they had very good correlation. They were predicting in general of hydraulics engineering. They published. So that's what I was asking with the correlation coefficients, uh, whether you can tell anything about it. Uh, yeah, I think some of that validation results are in the model. I think we uh, we fit it based on kappa to kind of account for the fact that there's not, you know, the, the number of presence observations is much lower than absence. Thank you. Okay, and so we're getting very close to the end of time, but we will go to Stephen, and uh, then we'll go to David and uh, Mo. Did you want to have the last question of the day yeah. of the morning? Yeah. So we'll take three questions and then break for lunch, which means so we'll go to Stephen. Stephen. Um, thanks, you guys. Can, can you speak a little bit to or elaborate on? Risk assessment, You've, I've sort of heard it referred to in several talks this morning. Um, I'm kind of curious as to how the risk assessments are done, how they're evaluated, and how the assessments are informing operational decisions, because it seems like they are. Um, yeah, so in um, each of the technical me meetings, so the smelt working group, uh, smelting monitoring team, and the same monitoring team, uh, I kind of provide an operational update to them. This is how we think it would be, the, present the modeling results. Um, but then it is an open discussion kind of amongst the members there to assess under this condition, do we think this is a high risk of containment for this species or a low risk of containment? Um, that will then go to guiding some recommendations for OMAR management. Um, the qualitative synthetic process, not a, not a quantitative. Yeah, the, okay. generally, yes, yeah, more qualitative. <laughs> so, one quick question for you. The, well, the, um, I can certainly see why you would need to use the ESM2 particle tracking to try to get quick answers. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have any. How much information you have about how well that forms relative to a treatment of a field acting model? I uh, cannot think of any way to say how well a, even do, any particle tracking model will respond to how well a fish egg moves or how the larval actually moves to the system. Uh, it's kind of a relatively unknown. We can't put a tracker on a Delta smell larvae to tell where it came from. And... How does it respond to a three dimensional part of a tracking model? Like, do you, or how is it compared? I, I do not know that. So, no. I, actually, could you just repeat the question? I think, well, I, I think there was difficulty. I was just asking how much fidelity there is between, say, a full, between the DSM2 particle tracking model and a full three dimensional particle tracking. If you ran the same simulation. So, no, I've never seen a comparison between the two. Thanks. Okay, that's just a question. And you've got the last question of the morning. Great. Well, thank you for the, thank you for the presentations. So I have two technical questions. Uh, the last slide, I'm very glad to see that you're using the chef values. Um, I do use cause and inference, so I like the interpretability of machine learning models. But I was trying to understand because Depending on the values, whether they are positive or negative, that is indicative of whether the predictor has a positive relationship or an inverse relationship uh, with respect to the what we want to predict. And it seems like in your graph or figure, you had both positive and negative values. So is am I interpreting this correctly, that those predictors 
uh, flip their relationship with with what you're trying to predict, or it's just the plotting. You basically put it as positive or negative depending on the absence or the. Yeah, so I, I did simplify that a little bit. So in the actual report, you will see three different figures because we have three categorical variables. Uh, for simplicity's sake, I just put prediction for absence. So when you see negative, it's the opposite of absence, which that can, can be confusing. So presence, and when it's positive, that means it's trying to, it's contributing towards absence. But the relationship is consistent between the predictors and the pre predictant. In that figure. Yeah. In that, okay, yeah. I see. And then for you, um, you showed the precipitation forecast, um, and then you talked about deterministic forecast for the flow. So my understanding is that the precipitation forecasts are like ensemble forecasts. How do you move from that to deterministic? Or are you just simply using the ensemble data? So I'm not fully, I don't have full understanding of how that, that's what I mean, uh, sorry. Uh, how the CNRFC gets from their, they, yeah, they have an ensemble of uh, precipitation forecasts. They do tear, bend it down to one kind of precipitation. And then they also have the ensembles of their flow forecast. Um, they take a certain amount of uh, experience to try to tweak the deterministic to be within their ensembles to where they want it to be. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not too in depth. I don't have that much knowledge on the in depth of the workings. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks, Mara. And many thanks to the, the panelists and the speakers for this morning. Uh, we'll reconvene, I would suggest, perhaps at 1 15, Laura, so that everyone gets a full hour for lunch. And it also gives the committee members that had questions and didn't have a chance to ask you. Put, please pick up the panelists uh, on your way out for lunch. So we'll reconvene at 1.15 for the open mic session, uh, but let's just thank all of the panelists. We know the pressures you're under and putting these presentations together have really helped us to uh, unravel all the complexities and the challenges that the modeling community faces. So thank you. And the fi final reminder, if you wish to speak in the open mic session, uh, there's a pad on the back, please feel free to uh, add your name. Okay, if we could uh, get started in this open mic session. <laughs> well, welcome back, everyone. After lunch, we've now got a mix of uh, people who will be giving us remarks online and people who are here live with us. Uh, we've got 14 people signed up. So again, there's a lot of interest. So uh, what we're going to do is give each of the, the people five minutes. It's up to them how they use their five minutes. If they want to be shorter than that, and entertain a question from the committee, that's great. If they want to take the whole five minutes to get their point across, that's great. And of course, on behalf of the committee, we welcome any written comments afterwards that the speakers might feel that they, they didn't cover adequately. And so what, what I'll do is call out the, um, the name of the speaker and also the next person, just so that they could be prepared. And D Dylan, Stern, Dr. Stern, if you'd like to come and uh, with the Delta Stewardship Council, will be the first speaker. And then we'll go to Ashley Overhouse with the Defenders of Wildlife. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, I'm Dylan Stern, and I'm a program manager with the Delta Science Program at the Delta Stewardship Council. Um, and it is a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I really appreciate um, all of the time that you're putting into this review. And I, I know that it's a lot because I've been facilitating peer reviews for quite some time uh, at the Delta Science Program. And we have a lot of reviews right now that we're facilitating that are sort of overlapping with the charge that you're tasked with. And so I wanted to come here today to let you know that that's the case. And I'm here to help connect the dots um, if there are 
questions about what our panels are looking at versus what you're charged with. Um, so that's kind of the role that I'm here. Um, but I guess let me start with a bit of an introduction. Um, the Delta Science Program, um, our, our mission was established by the 2009 Delta Reform Act um, to provide the best possible unbiased scientific information for water and environmental decision making in the Bay Delta system. And uh, that included in that a, a number of core functions that the science program does, and it's out of the whole delicious pie. Um, I'm here to talk about the independent scientific peer review slice. Um, and so since 2010, the science program has coordinated over 30 peer reviews and advice panels. Um, and I've personally um, facilitated a number of those. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. And so, so our job really—that <laughs> was a weird noise. Sorry about that. Uh, our our job is to the volume gets a little psychedelic. You should roll with it. Okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Siri's getting involved too. Okay, wow. Um, so anyway, our our job, sort of like the NAS panel, is is really to um, be an honest broker um, for reviewing government science. Uh, that is crit critical to decision making. Uh, we have policies and procedures that are outlined in the Delta Science Plan. Uh, the appendices have specific procedures that we always follow for all of our peer review. Um, and yeah, so I wanted to put together um, a timeline of all the different peer reviews that are going on so that uh, so that you're aware. We have at the top here, the blue is, is this current uh, committee. And um, at the same time, the Delta Science Program has several reviews um, happening that have already happened, that are going to happen, um, that are related. And so on behalf of Bureau of Reclamation, we've recently completed the Water Temperature Management Platform Review, which was a two-part review and took quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, and we're beginning the LTO Biological Assessment Fish and Aquatic Resources Effects Analysis Peer Review. Um, and that is, is supposed to be wrapped up um, in spring of 2025. And um, I will definitely make sure you all get these slides. Um, and, and then on behalf of Department of Water Resources, um, we're facilitating the summer fall habitat action review, which probably sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> and then we're, we're also about to facilitate a spring run JPE um, peer review. I'll go into a little more detail on all of these. So the uh, the water temperature modeling platform review, like I said, is completed. Um, we had a, a five person panel looking at temperature models, uh, a brand new platform of temperature models, um, and sort of this like really collaborative uh, effort to develop models for all of the major uh, dams in the Central Valley project. It was quite an impressive task, um, and there were really good reviews about the process. Um, and let's see, so those those two reports um, are available on the Delta Science Program website, um, and I'll make sure you get a, a link to that. Um, <clears throat> and then the LTO uh, biological assessment specifically focuses on the fish and aquatic effects analysis, and that is in progress. It recently kicked off, and uh, we were asked to um, review the draft biological assessment that's required um, as an input to the Environmental Species Act process to develop the biological opinions. And uh, specifically, the charge really focuses on the approach, uh, the analytical approach, which is a new approach um, for the effects of the Central Valley Project on the exposure response and risk to ESA listed species. And also the appropriate use of quantitative and qualitative methods and risk assessment tools. And the final report is expected in April, 2024. And then moving to DWR, um, they're sponsoring reviews <clears throat> on the summer fall habitat action. Uh, the 2020 incidental take permit that's issued by CDFW um, for the long-term operations of the state water project requires a couple different, well, it requires a whole host of things but namely for that's relevant here is the, the science and monitoring plans for each of the, the habitat actions. Um, 
And then it also requires independent review of those actions, um, of those plans. And so, plan, not the results. The exactly, results. there are no okay. results. Uh, well, yeah, so there are no results being reviewed as part of this, yeah. Um, and then that's expected to wrap up June of, of this year as well. And here are the exact review materials for summer fall habitat action. Um, there was a, I don't know, the, the panel did a great job going into the details of all of these um, these four different uh, actions. And there are monitoring and science plans that accompany all of these actions. Um, and that is the focus of, of the peer review is to look at those documents. Um, and also the structured decision-making approach that's, that uh, takes all of this into consideration and translate that to a decision ultimately. Okay, and then another review coming up is the spring run Chinook salmon juvenile production estimate. Heard a lot about the JPE. Um, currently it's in scoping phase, um, but this is also a requ requirement of the incidental take permit. The, uh, uh, the department needs to develop a, a JPE for spring run um, and uh, within five years of 2020. So that'll put us at 2025 is the due date for that. And there's a whole plan that, uh, that is drafted and so the Delta Science Program um, is facilitating a peer review of that document. <clears throat> and yeah, so we are expecting that to start in early 2025. Um, so I guess I just want to um, say thank you to uh, Bureau of Reclamation and Specifically, Josh and Mario and Dave have been really amazing. They their approach to peer review has been consistent, open, and transparent, um, and have been amazing partners throughout uh, throughout the, my experience. Um, and the Delta Science Program has facilitated since the twenty uh, since the two thousand nine two thousand eight biological opinions. Um, one of the sort of RPA actions was to conduct peer review on an annual basis. Um, and so the Delta Science Program facilitated those reviews. And again, a lot of overlap uh, here. It's it's really about managing the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. And um, <clears throat> it's it's a similar method. I think that if if this uh, the next phase of this committee would be sort of a biennial uh, format, it would be a similar sort of setup that we've done. And so I just wanted to provide some some of the historical um, lessons learned, I guess. And, um, you know, a lot of the topics are are evergreen topics that are still unresolved. And um, that's why y'all are here to, to solve all of that, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got this. Uh, some of the topics include temperature modeling, um, modeling and management. The Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring Program was brought to us for peer review. Um, new new methods for loss estimation and trainment um, when the JPE was being developed uh, for <clears throat> for winter run that was also under peer review um, the cumulative salvage index calculation um, so yeah and and many more topics um, you know sometimes they would focus on particular operations for Clear Creek or a Stanislaw River or something like that. Um, but it was a collaborative decision to decide on what the most important topics were of the time. So some of the, the valuable outcomes that, that I saw, and this is just sort of my look at it, is uh, moving the temperature compliance point upriver to the salmon habitat that's actually in use is sort of a, a great outcome um, of, you know, the panel was able to look at uh, moving the temperature compliance point so that you're not using enough, too much water to push the temperature down um, and really to focus on where the reds actually were in the river. Um, and then I think it's really valuable, uh, which I've sort of already mentioned, is just the whole process of evaluating goals um, and objectives is sort of an adaptive management uh, framework. And there have been just so many improvements across monitoring, modeling, I can't even go into all of it, but um, I think these reports that have been uh, compiled uh, that we facilitated are really good resources. If you want to go down a rabbit hole of everything that's 
been uh, discussed uh, on temperature management or OMR that uh, we've had experts opine on these subjects before, um, and it could be really useful for this committee. Um, and I just wanted to mention a couple uh, recommendations that sort of are evergreen, I guess, and just keep coming up. Um, and I, you've heard it already through the, um, the meetings that I've been to already. So linking the success of achieving physical targets, such as temperature and flow in management actions uh, to the actual biological and ecological responses of listed species. Um, and then resource management um, really must include the flexibility, flexibility to adjust to a new normal. And that's recognizing climate change and weather extremes. Um, and just also wanted to emphasize the importance of uh, recognizing operational constraints and resource constraints um, so that these recommendations can be of the greatest use. And um, just, yeah, that's that's it for me. Um, I'm available if you have any questions about how peer reviews are connected. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. And yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Bill. Sorry, it took so long. Oh, thanks a lot. Thank you. We did give uh, Dylan a break. He came at very short notice just to give us an update of the reviews. And I think it was important to spend those few minutes so we know exactly what other reviews are going on and how that might fit with what we're doing. So, Dylan, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. So, the uh, next speaker will be. Um, will be Ashley, and then we'll go. She she emailed to say that she's not um not able to speak. Uh, okay, that that was because Dylan took her time. And so in that case, we'll go to uh, virtual. We'll go to Dr. Gartrell, and then we'll go to uh, Brett Baker after that. So. I don't see either of them online. Neither of them online? Okay, hey, we're doing really well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so seriously, if Brett or Greg uh, do join us, we'll add you later in the list. Uh, you haven't missed your opportunity. Uh, so the next person on the list is uh, Kego Mertz. Thanks for coming back with Friends of the River. Do we have her in person? No? Um, we are doing well. Uh, how about uh, virtually uh, Glen Spain with the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations and Institutes for Fisheries Resources? Yeah, okay, Glenn, can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you very well. That's great. Okay, I don't know if the camera is working or not. Uh, Glenn Spain, I'm the Northwest Regional Director for the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association and its sister organization, Institute for Fisheries Resources. I've been following uh, the process, of course. I want to urge the committee to really look at the temperature standards. There's uh, a, a great deal of evidence that the temperature standards, some of which are more than 30 years old, are inadequate and not protective enough of salmon, particularly. Uh, and I sent you, as a committee, I sent you a copy of a letter from the Pacific Fishery Management Council, essentially begging the agencies to deal with and review on the best uh, basis of best available science those standards. Right now, the standards are roughly two and a half degrees Fahrenheit too high to prevent the kind of egg mortality that we're seeing and that resulted in a closure, complete closure uh, last year and likely a near complete closure this year. Uh, the standards were written into the 2019 biop for the salmon and they've been disastrous. They basically, uh, it, it's proof, if any proof is needed that those standards are not protective. We had as much as for winter run, for instance, we had a 97% mortality rate uh, smolt, uh, egg to smolt uh, survival rates of less than 3%. So that's just, you know, not possible to continue these stocks under those conditions. I think that that is one of the things that the committee could very easily look at 
and look at the science behind the current standards and make some recommendations for number one, what the standards should be, and number two, how they can be monitored and how they can be enforced. So I'd like you uh, to uh, uh, bring that to your attention. Thank you, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Glenn, that was very clear and we did receive the, the, the letter, so we appreciate that. Um, the next speaker is going to be Scott Hamilton. Are you ready, Scott? And after that, we'll go to uh, Cindy Meyer. Uh, so, Scott, you, welcome you. back. Thank you. Meyer, am I ready to go here? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, I wouldn't know about that by myself. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I just wanted to touch on a couple of um, items, um, a, a little bit more on fall habitat and entrainment. Um, and there we go. Um, so uh, just starting off with fall habitat, I think you're probably aware that the system is driven by our um, winter and spring storms that not only bring a lot of um, precipitation into the valley, but also very huge snowpacks that last throughout the year. So that if we have big winter and spring storms, we likely have big inflows right throughout the year. Um, the problem then is trying to differentiate which flows when were really important during the year. The problem with the fall outflow is that whenever we've had a big fall outflow, it's essentially always been associated with a big spring inflow. And what's been the influence? Has it been the spring inflow or has it been the fall outflow? A lot of the fall outflow actions assume the correlation without getting the mechanism right. So that, um, so we've had the, in the big wet years the where double smelt typically do really well, we've had eight or so months of really great flows. The question is, if you just have some moderate increase in flows in September and October, as is proposed in the fall outflow action, can you really replicate the eight months that's gone on before that, right? And I think that's sort of what's been missing. Um, the original fall outflow an analysis um, was really that the relationship that they got there was a stock recruitment analysis, but it was really that the relationship was really driven by two points. Those two points occurred in the middle of five wet years. If and and the uh, analysis was done looking at um, fall flows, but excluded spring flows from the analysis. If they had included spring flows in the analysis, the fall flows would have been statistically insignificant, and all of the relationship would have gone to the spring flows. So the original analysis that the fall outflow action was based on was flawed. And since then, there's been more than a dozen studies that some of those have just repeated exactly the same problem because they didn't recognize the correlation without the mechanism, or they've looked at it and found no support for fall action. So moving on to entrainment. Um, this is a map that was published by Mers et al. in 2011. Um, it shows the distribution of delta smelt throughout the estuary by life stage. Uh, and it starts with larval and it goes through. So the larval is the dark green. It goes through to the purple as the mature adults. What you can see there is that delta smelt are only in the south delta and vulnerable to pumps um, for a small percentage of their life stage. And it's a small, like they're infrequently detected there compared to other areas. So what we're saying here is that there's a complex set of mechanisms that causes delta smelt to move into the south delta. Now, I would, sorry, and let me just go back to this other, because I wanted to make this point clear. Even this, this is, these are average results, right? So on average, yes, there are um, 
you know, it's we don't see a lot of smelt in the South Delta as a percentage sort of as compared to other areas. But at certain times and in certain years, there is going to be an impact. And our modeling has indicated that in those kind of years, there will be a population level impact. So even though it's not very frequent, when it does occur, you know, it is important and we need to address it. So I didn't want you to think that it's not an issue based on this map. Um, so that sort of brings us a bit to where we are today. I don't know if you can read these numbers, but this is the daily report that DWR puts out on Delta um, conditions. And um, you can see at the moment that the Delta inflow is 120,000 cubic feet per second. Um, and our outflow index is 111,000 cubic feet per second. So essentially right now, we have a quarter of a million acre feet a day flowing out the Delta. And the question is, you know, given that like San Luis, Res you know, given that we've got a 15% allocation on the state project right now, given that San Luis Reservoir is, is less than half full on the state side, should we be so protective of Delta smelt under these conditions? Now, admittedly, the OMR restriction is for steelhead right now, not um, Delta smelt, but I would actually argue that yes, it is important to protect Delta smelt under these conditions. And too much to go into now, but historically, when we have these really big years, what we see is Delta smelt being moved westward during we these really big kind of outflows, and then they will move back to spawn. And this particular period, the spawning period that we're in right now, they will move back into the South Delta, regardless of OMR. Even against positive OMR, you might remember the graph before, we were seeing some, some positive, um, some, some salvage of Delta smelt, um, even when there's positive OMR, it's these kind of years where Delta smelt are moving back into the, the South Delta. And, and we can have reasonably high levels of take. So it's a high risk period that we need to be paying attention to. So what's it been now? 14 years ago that we last had a, an NRC panel look at the Delta issues. And one of the things that caught my attention here was that their comment that with the correct water engineering, entrainment effects might be eliminated. That really caught our attention. Um, so, so the idea here, like we, it's a big part of your agenda to look at OMR issues. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of meetings I've been to where OMR is being discussed. And I was sort of staggered to learn that the, the Bureau has got like a dozen people working on OMR issues. It seems to me in this day and age that we should be able to divert water without harming fish. Right? We, can, we put a man on the moon 50 years ago. We should be able to divert water without harming fish. So the concept here is just to use infiltration galleries. So they're very simply perforated pipes in gravel in the benthic zone. Um, and, um, and they're already installed on some rivers in California. The, the shot on the right shows the Tuolumne River where they used um, essentially well casing and then covered that back up with gravel. So we have spent, the, one of the groups that I work with um, has spent um, seven years and more than $2 million developing these, this concept. And we're now ready to move to a demonstration project in the Delta. And you've probably got lots of questions about this. And unfortunately, because there's format, you can't answer those, but we are aware of a lot of the different concerns that people have had about them. We've had teams of consultants working on this. We started off thinking, oh, we'll just start with this and we'll keep going until we hit a fatal flaw. We haven't hit a fatal flaw yet. Um, so it's very promising that we could implement this in the Delta. Like clearly it's instituted in a riverine system. The question is, can we institute this in a, in a estuarine system? So just to wrap up, um, full, uh, full next two actions based on, you know, what we consider to be a faulty analysis. And in the dozen years since, um, we've seen um, really no support for the action. And for OMR, we think that OMR is sort of a blunt instrument because it doesn't really recognize when we've got really low risk circumstances where we could pump more or really high risk circumstances where we could where we need to be more protective um, and we need to be looking at other alternatives. Thanks. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Scott. Okay.
Okay, uh, Cindy with us. Yeah, so Cindy will be next, and then we'll go to Diana Serino from uh, Contra Costa after, after you. Do you have a presentation? No, uh, sadly, I do not have a presentation. I came unprepared to class, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> So hi, I'm Cindy Meyer with San Luis Delta and Mendota Water Authority, I'm the Special Programs Manager and Science Program Coordinator down there. And I just want to say again, thank you for coming back. You didn't bail on us between the first meeting and this meeting, so thank you. That's a great start. Um, I also want to say thank you for the panel discussions yesterday. Um, they were so informative, and I'm so glad that some of the interested parties and, and folks that may not be in the, in the agencies were here to present information to you. Um, please reach out to them, ask questions. We can get you information, materials. Um, they know where to find us um, because they have so much knowledge and I find myself learning something new every day. So as we're moving forward, I want to use the current weather as a reference for you in this sort of challenge of consideration of the LTO. We have a lot of climate variability, especially in our precipitation patterns. Welcome to your second atmospheric river. Um, it's been noted that the first meeting also experienced an atmospheric river. There could be a correlation there. Um, we'll keep tracking the data and give you a, a re final report at the end. But as we sit here in this room, I can tell you that up in up in the mountains in Sierra in the Sierras here, up Highway 50, they're going to have the snow line come the whole way down, probably to about a thousand feet above sea level this weekend, and they're expecting up to five to eight feet of snow over the next 72 hours. So this creates a challenge, right, for water management because what's gonna happen most likely, um, it's a cold, dry storm and I'm not a hydrologist, so take it with a grain of salt, but the cold, dry storms, the snow tends to stay up there and we don't have as much runoff. The wetter storms, we have more runoff. If we have the runoff, then we're into flood operations at places like Folsom, okay? So we also have this whole system of human health and safety with the flood ops that plays into this. And as the more our precipitation patterns vary, the more challenging it gets for this management. And I just wanted to flag that for you guys since you're sitting here in the room and going to experience it during these couple of days, hopefully not on your tour tomorrow. Um, so I just wanted to flag that um, if you have any questions for me, again, I'm glad you enjoyed your trip to the Jones Pumping Plant. Um, our staff are very happy to have you. Um, and they are also a resource for you. If you, if you need anything, um, Scott Peterson um, and Seth would be more than happy to provide additional information. So thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Great. Well, thanks, Cindy, for coming back. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and I yield my other minute to the young. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, we, we have skis and we will travel. Yeah. Um, you're more than welcome. I will not live here. No. To Deanna Serino, and then we'll go to Jay Ziegler. Welcome back, Deanna. Hi, everyone. Um, so I do have slides, but I just did them over lunch. So um, <laughs> forgive the right. I wasn't going to talk to you guys today. I thought you might have heard enough from me last time. Um, there was a very good question that the panel asked during the first part of the meeting. And so I wanted to kind of give our perspective on that. And that's why I wanted to jump in. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Just share a few points in. So um, just because you have met a lot of people and i um, not sure how memorable I am, I am including just a reminder of, oops, see if that can go forward, of how I fit into the system. <laughs> I work for Contra Costa Water District. Um, we are, uh, the service area is shaded in green. We're within the Delta and just outside of it. You'll remember that we have four Delta intakes. Um, so we divert CVP water that makes us a CVP contractor. And this is how we work with reclamation on um, deliveries from the CVP, but we're diverting not through the export facilities where today you've heard all about entrainment and salvage at the export facilities, but through our own intakes. So we have kind of a unique perspective. We do a lot of our own analysis trying to um, understand the system ourselves because we're, again, operating for intakes. Um, and I grabbed some slides from last time just to remind you of who I am. So forgive me, another slide from last time. These two intakes of ours are north of the export facilities. 
and south of the old and middle river flow gauges. And so we were right in the midst, right? <laughs> so this is how we end up involved in this. And I think the presentation that uh, DWR gave you this morning showed that they uh, include diversions from these two of our intakes in their old and middle river index analysis. So that's how, kind of how we met it, fit into it. And because of this, we work really closely with reclamation and DWR on a regular basis. Um, to ensure OMR management is complied with and we're not affecting them. So it's um, it works really well, it really does, but as we get more and more OMR regulation, it's a concern of, I think Reclamation talked about this morning about how many people they have working on OMR. You add how many people the Fish and Wildlife Service does in NIMS, it's maybe 20 to 40 people, I think is what Dave said, working on OMR for six months out of the year. So add us into it too. Um, okay, so. This is also from last time. You remember, I looked at modeling last time. We did particle tracking modeling. And this is looking at two time periods that have very similar OMR values, but very different entrainment. So let's see if I can do a, because I can't get over there. So I'm going to try this laser pointer. OK, so this one on the left is an OMR value. And this is measured at those USGS gauges on Old and Middle River of minus 4,600. And this panel is minus 4,850. The particles at the end of 28 days of simulation are just shown on the map where they last were. And those that left the map, some were entrained um, down at the CVP and, CVP and SWP export pumps, as well as they can be entrained in, in ag diversions, or they could leave the system to the bay. They excerpt past Martinez on the west. So the main difference was two very similar OMR, two very different results in terms of entrainment. So OMR, Old and Middle River, um, even the measurement value, not even the index, the measurement value itself is not gonna be a perfect predictor of entrainment. It gives you a good indicator of regional hydrodynamics and it is a good metric for that. It's not gonna be a perfect indicator, right? So we, what this is from this morning and I'm going to take a copyright infringement. Um, but I wanted to, re this is why I thought I'd jump back up and bother you guys again. Um, today, there was a lot of talk about the relationship between salvage at the CVP and SWP export facilities and this OMR value. This is from Lenny's paper back in 2009. Um, and this is what was shown today. And uh, Denise very astutely recognize that, of course, that's a continuum. It's There's not a hockey stick to these relationships. And this is for Delta smelt and longfin smelt. Lenny's paper includes a lot of other species as well. Um, so the question was, how, how do we set an OMR threshold? How do we set an OMR threshold without you know, a hockey stick? It's a, it's a continuum. Um, so uh, we absolutely agree. And I wanted to kind of jump up on, on, on our perspective on answering that. Um, we did similar analysis. In fact, Lenny was the one who helped us kind of get all the data into it. Um, and we wanted to first say, well, let me go back here. So how do we set the threshold? In my mind, the threshold needs to be protecting the species. So how do we protect the species? Well, let's look at salvage as a proportion of the species. And that's what we did back in 2012. So we took salvage and we normalized it for the different species in our analysis. So I provided for the committee our 2012 report. I'm sorry, it's really outdated. We are in the middle of updating it with um, new data and with new models, um, but this is from the 2012 report because it's what is published out there. Um, this is daily salvage as opposed to annual. You know, Lenny's graph was looking at annual salvage. This is daily salvage, but it's normalized. For the, so for the smelts, we normalized it by fall midwater trawl. It's not a population number, but it's an approximate indicator of what how the population varies. As, as the fall midwater trawl index, which is the amount of uh, adult delta smelt that are out there in the fall, as that varies year to year, it gives you kind of an indication of population. So we didn't have population numbers back then, but we did have the index. So we were able to normalize it that way. Um, and while there's definitely a lot of scatter here, um, and I didn't do fits on the daily data, we only did fits on the annual data like Lenny did, um, you, you see that the highest a uh, salvage, of course, occurs when you get past the minus five range. And but you get salvage on even the the positive OMR values. OMR is not going to be a perfect indicator, but it is. It, there is definitely a relationship there um, with normalized salvage. So for smelts, we use fall midwater trawl. For longfin smelt, this is the same. Um, although here I'm showing the difference between again these are straight out of the 2012 report. The top two plots um, are salvaged directly. Um, again, against the USGS data and the flow index that we did in 2012. I apologize for not clarifying that on the last one. I'm not trying to distinguish them right now. I'm just trying to say 
Tops are salvaged. The bottom is normalized salvage. So for long fin smelt, just looking at salvage, you would say, you know, don't really get any until you get to, to minus 5,000 when you just look at total number of smelt salvaged. But when you normalize that with the fall midwater trawl index, you can see that there was a year in the 2000s where we definitely had um, on a proportional basis with their, with their population, perhaps a greater salvage event than not. So um, looking back into what caused this is the aspect of the analysis we're doing now, because clearly there's something going on at that point in time, what else was going on in the system? So that is uh, smelts. I wanted to mention steelhead because everyone's talked about it today. So this hatchery steelhead in the system were, are all ad clipped. So you can do a population normalization for clipped steelhead. So when you look at the 2012 report, you'll see that we did this analysis for all steelhead, wild are obviously not clipped, and that's just salvage, we can't normalize it. But then when it comes down to the clipped salvage, we were able to normalize it based on how many steelhead are released into the system every year and clipped every year. So, um, and Lenny, thank you, did this analysis initially in a steelhead uh, project work team with the IEP great source of information, the IEP and analysis and wonderful sharing. So he helped me get to be able to re redo this analysis um, so that I could compare it with our flow index as well. So there's definitely a relationship. You can you can normalize steelhead on the clipped side. We don't know what the what the wild are doing. But I mentioned this today because we're all this steelhead salvage we're getting at the exports. I'm sure many of you are aware that um, East Bay Municipal Utility District right now had a wonderful steelhead return year and their hatchery is releasing uh, smolts into the system. And in February, they released over 60,000 um, steelhead into the system. So the OMAR thresholds that are in the permits that you are working on now, those are based on like thresholds to look at average salvage historically. Well, here we have an, a banger year where they've released a lot of hatchery steelhead in the system. We should expect that salvage is gonna go up relative to historical. So I just wanted to mention that, and I think that the DWR and Reclamation are looking more into it and working with East Bay Mud to kind of get at the numbers and how to identify what is coming from their stream. Um, but it is, an, it is uh, helpful to be able to have the hatchery all marked, which they did. They, they ad clipped them, and they also put in coded wire tags, so that'll be useful. Um, so as I mentioned, we're updating our report. We are incorporating more recent data. I think the data in the report went through 2011, so we've gone through everything. Um, and we're also shifting from looking at, at salvage to entrainment because pre-screen pre loss is different between the facilities. So if you're just adding salvage, it, it's not the same. Um, and the sampling efficiency is different as well um, and utilizing new models. So in response to the question, of this I think is a great question, is our recommendation would be to consider how entrainment affects the species so that we're targeting the OMR management to something that has an effect on the species as opposed to getting the, the noise in the data. So I also have a summary slide and that's it, I promise. <laughs> um, again, our ask for the committee is, is how it affects the species. And I just pull back to what we've talked about previously that we're evaluating this alternative index to be able to target, have the management target the species. Cause we, ha we have this possibility that using OMAR as an indicator involves other people in the system that don't entrain fish. And so we're one of them with positive barrier fish screens on all of our intakes. And so. Looking at this from a, a, how do you apply science to regulations aspect? So it's not pure science, it's it's how does it get built into the regulatory system? And I think that this is something we need to consider. That's all I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Try to close Thanks, it. Uh, Deanna. And it is worth just pointing out to the committee members who aren't here. This, we've heard from DWR modelers, we've heard from reclamation modelers, but there are these other powerhouse groups that really do great work. And Contra Costa have had several decades. Um, perhaps you can catch the, the speakers at the end of the session. We should get going. And Jay Ziegler will be next, followed by, uh, we'll go online to Deirdre Desjardins after that. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. Jay Ziegler. I'm uh, still relatively new Delta Watermaster. Uh, I haven't seen Renee in this new role yet, so I can say that, I think. 
Uh, and I, I do appreciate the opportunity to have joined you on your uh, last uh, tour through the Delta uh, about a month ago. And so uh, let me tell you a bit about this office. Uh, the office was established um, pursuant to the Delta Reform Act uh, enacted in 2009, has the responsibility of administering water rights uh, across the legal delta. Uh, so uh, as you're now well aware, this is a 700,000 square mile region, approximately 400,000 irrigated acres of agriculture in this area. And there are roughly 2,300 points of diversion along those 56 uh, discrete larger islands uh, in the legal delta. And uh, this office is charged with the responsibility of administering water rights uh, consistent with protection of public trust values. So water quality uh, paramount to those concerns uh, and uh, tribal beneficial uses, recreation, uh, other values uh, to protect uh, the public's interest uh, in freshwater ecosystems and the values that they support for people. Uh, I really, um, I, I uh, welcome the opportunity to talk to a number of you because I was uh, amusing about um, in my 30 years of experience around the Delta, uh, what I've learned most is uh, to try to disaggregate the Delta and think about what values we are managing to in different sub-regions of the Delta. And I would uh, really encourage uh, the panel to dig, to dig deeper uh, in that area. Uh, in particular, uh, it would be my aspiration, and I think um, many of those that you heard from this morning uh, and uh, this afternoon as well, that you are designing modeling uh, to really inform uh, project operations on a, on a, on a rather specific time scale. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure that you are also availing the committee of uh, contemporary modeling and experiments that the department uh, Dylan had mentioned, and that the state board uh, are undertaking in this moment. Uh, some of that is in the context of the update of the water quality control plan, but also with larger ecological objectives and strategies in mind. So I want to make sure that we are um, providing those resources to you uh, as you look at potential for um, informing operations uh, that are more protective of the state and federally listed endangered species in the Delta. Uh, in particular, and I think Renee noted this a little bit earlier today, uh, it would be my hope that um, much as over time we have focused significant resources in uh, monitoring juvenile populations of threatened uh, fisheries, that we um, actually move to um, better modeling, better focus on adult populations to, under, to better understand predator relationships uh, on those species and, 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 and the co-relationship of restoration activities, flow and water quality uh, uh, to the to really um, develop standards that better protect these uh, species in conjunction uh, with project operations. Uh, finally, um, I uh, as uh, in moving forward, um, quite specifically, this project happens in a dynamic moment where the Department of Water Resources is considering uh, the um, uh, installation of operational gates to affect, uh, which largely are designed to protect elevation uh, with some effect on water quality in the South Delta, generally in lower flow periods in the Delta, though that this past summer was an exception to that, where simply uh, the, the gates were needed to uh, protect access uh, in areas of the Delta uh, that otherwise uh, would not have had water while the, while the projects were pumping. Um, and so I think it is, it's, it's important if we, if we are moving to a world where we're looking at sort of a permanent feature uh, in the installation uh, of um, operable gates affecting tidal elevations, we should also be looking at barriers um, that, uh, that have been tested and modeled and where we have substantial literature uh, that a old river barrier operated in sync with uh, operable gates may have significant benefits uh, for salmonid migration. And we know that we're seeing, uh, based on almost all of the literature, near 100% um, uh, mortality in salmon. We have to do things differently. And so if we're moving forward in one vein to think about, OK, this is what we need to enhance project operations, we also need to concurrently think about how do we actually keep, uh, as, as Diana has just noted, how do we design strategies uh, that keep 
Salmonids away from the gates uh, to the first place and provide an alternative passage uh, in the southern delta. So I think that becomes a, a very specific area uh, that the committee has an opportunity to focus on and, and better inform uh, in its mandate. Um, finally, I want to just kind of take some of you through uh, some of the side conversations that I had an opportunity to have with you on the field trip. Again, disaggregating the delta, thinking about the contemporary strategies that, that uh, all water agencies, and Diana's given a good uh, overview of, the, of uh, uh, the sophistication that Contra Costa applies uh, in its diversion practices. But to think about um, if, if we are really designing experiments in the cash slew uh, complex to enhance uh, 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 ecological values to really make this effectively a zone where we're trying to take advantage of diurnal tidal cycles to export phytoplankton and zooplankton to the rest of the delta. We need to think about inflow in this subregion of the delta, uh, as well as the tidal dynamics, and to make sure that we're very carefully modeling that to ensure that all of the effort that we're putting in floodplain uh, restoration is actually performing to enhance uh, the uh, uh, both. Uh, the food chain development as well as habitat values uh, that we're managing for uh, in the in the northern delta or the cash slew complex. I think as you look uh, to the eastern delta, increasingly there's a public awareness that we need to provide room for the rivers there and uh, the Kasemnes, the, the uh, only undammed tributary uh, in the valley, um, and uh, just the awareness of these increasingly uh, big winter storms and what they mean uh, for both a flood protection purpose as well as a habitat purpose. And how can we provide room for the rivers uh, in places that actually enhance habitat values? In the Southern Delta, thinking more creatively about places where uh, uh, in the example, thinking of if we're moving forward in the installation of operable gates, how do we actually move forward uh, with uh, tested strategies such as a barrier uh, at Old River that will provide enhancement for salmon passage and thinking about the practical dynamics of uh, accelerated uh, siltation rates in the Southern Delta and the need uh, for programs that address uh, public safety there, including dredging uh, to provide a, a sort of better reliability in some of those channels in, in a way that is not ecologically undermining uh, uh, water quality or other objectives that we're managing to. Um, and so finally, I think um, my hope uh, in the work of the committee is that you avail yourself of a lot of the contemporary modeling, um, some of this being done in the monitoring and special studies program uh, that uh, the board has approved that DWR and other and the South Delta Water Agencies and others are involved in. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and additionally, thinking about uh, how do we more creatively manage uh, the uh, project operations uh, in sync with experimentation um, in how um, uh, how we're taking advantage of the ebb tide or uh, and, and you know, kind of thinking a little more creatively about project operations aligned with fish migration, uh, fish movements in the Delta. Uh, and apply uh, really contemporary analyses to these issues. And on the hydrodynamic side, um, I, I hope the committee is really thinking about the application of tools like OpenET to better understand uh, applied hydrodynamics in the Delta. Uh, and I, I will say that I've just come from a conference. I'm extremely enthusiastic that this technology is just taking off and in, in the ability uh, that it's going to really deliver to understand complex hydrodynamic systems like uh, the Delta. So that's what I wanted to leave you with today. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to join you today. And, and, uh, and again, thinking of the complexities of the Delta, disaggregating the Delta to manage to different values uh, that actually help um, protect public trust values and ecosystem values um, in uh, the Sacramento, San Francisco, uh, Bay Estuary. Uh, so thank you for the, your time today and uh, thank you for undertaking this challenge. And uh, it, it's uh, on behalf of uh, all Californians in this uh, complex environment and ecosystem, we greatly appreciate your investment of time, intellect, and creativity in this effort. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jay. As articulate as ever. And I'll break our own rule here. Just very quickly, is there a timeline on the water quality 
plan update? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, to just see yeah. How it would uh, so roughly, Peter, what I would say is um, it's 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 probably uh, I think in in public meetings uh, the board uh, and board staff uh, have been clear that we're looking at not uh, 2024, uh, but rather sometime 2025. My best guess in that would be um, probably the third quarter um, uh, in 2025 that it might come before the board uh, for for an actionable vote. Great. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so we're going to go online now to Deirdre Dujardin, and then uh, we'll go to Sarah Piramoon with the Santa Clara Water District. Deirdre, thanks for being with us. Can you hear us? There we go. So Deirdre, Deirdre Dan with California Water Research, and um, I'm uh, I've got the a talk on 21st century hydroclimate trends in the Western US and the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta watershed and how they're influenced by climate change. Um, so, bring up my screen. So, I just wanted to start with a quote uh, from uh, the 2015 What of California's Drought Continues. Uh, by Hannock, Jay Lund, Jeff Mount, Peter Moyle, and, and others. Many of California's aquatic ecosystems remain chronically starved for habitat and water in all years. Native species enter droughts with diminished and geographically limited populations, only to encounter greater stresses during drought. And this is the key issue for 21st century droughts. They're getting hotter and drier and they're being much more stressful for aquatic species. And we need to manage water so that they recover sufficiently to survive. Um, this is uh, October to April precipitation across the Western US. And you can see the increased frequency of droughts in the 21st century. And it's not predicted by the uh, current generation of couple climate models, not by the ensemble mean, that they predicted that we would be seeing a generally wetter trend. Um, I uh, pulled the NOAA climate data. Uh, there's been a particularly noticeable decline in January and February across the Western US when you look at the standardized precipitation index. And it really jumps out at you if you look across California climate divisions. Um, and this is the distribution. And you can see it, um, it's by Pacific to cattle oscillation period. I found that very helpful to characterize it. And you can see we've got more wet and more dry extremes and the median of the distribution has shifted drier, not only in California, but also across the West. This is the same, we see the same pattern across Sacramento and San Joaquin watersheds and across the North Coast uh, division, which climate division, which includes Trinity uh, Dam and the Trinity River. Um, January and February happen to be the months which have the highest correlation with uh, El Nino um, precipitation. And we've been seeing a much more La Nina-like trend. Uh, this is the multivariate ENSO index, which best captures it, but a, a very cool trend in the Pacific. And the thing is, we're starting to figure out it's not the, the pattern of warming that we've seen is not captured by the current generation of climate models. And the US Climate Variability and Predictability Program of the workshop in 2022. And the consensus was, this is a huge issue, not only for hydroclimate, but also um, the cooling pattern may have uh, masked to climate sensitivity. Um, and they said the most pressing question is whether climate model simulations will be as far off from observations 
in the future as they have been relative to recent past conditions. And we just, we know the models are biased. We don't, it's really an open question right now. And we're not managing for this risk. And in fact, the California State Auditor investigated and found DWR is relying on a 2010 drought plan. And they just, and they identified the drought plan does not identify how the expected more severe impacts of drought may specifically strain the state water project's responsibilities to meet water quality and flow standards for the protection of wildlife. It also does not describe whether DWR may need to take new actions to address these more severe impacts or the challenges it may face in doing so. And the whole way this review is structured, you're laser focused on OMR in a single year and not the fact that entrainment is much higher in dry years. And so it's really important to look at these overall climate trends and look at the research that's uh, part, part of the US Cliver program. I happen to be in contact with those researchers and it's cutting edge research and it's incredibly important, not just for hydroclimate, um, but observed warming has accelerated and you can see that in our watersheds. There's this huge uh, dis shift in temperature. It's, there's now, uh, you can see there's a median of almost four degrees Fahrenheit uh, across California and the West um, with peaks in mean annual temperature that are even higher. Um, and I was just stunned when I, I looked at the change in temperature across the California climate divisions. It's five degrees, over five degrees Fahrenheit in some months on the South Coast. And even on Northern California, it's two to four degrees Fahrenheit. And this, we just haven't seen this because we've been looking at linear trends. These are the trend, this, it's much hotter than it was in 98 to 2012, the previous PDO period. It's, it's, it, the warming has accelerated and that isn't being taken into account. It, it's a huge risk for salmon and, and other species that are dependent on cold water. Um, and it's part of a global trend. Um, this is, shows, uh, there's a IGCC annual report that's generated using the same methods as IPCC synthesis. And they found that anthropogenic warming has accelerated uh, since the IPCC 2021 report. And if you've been looking at the news, it's a huge concern because of the step increases in temperature that were highly anomalous in 2023, and we're still figuring it out. So um, there's also the Earth's energy imbalance has increased for reasons we don't really understand. And it's really a case where we cannot manage these species right on the edge of uh, extinction. They won't have the populations won't have the resilience to get through this. And um, it's also important to understand that this affects water supply, this affects water yield, and we're not taking it into account uh, in like the delivery capability report. Um, it, 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 and so the, the state water contractors said like, why did we only get 5% in 2021 and 2022? And, and the delivery capability report said the minimum would be 20%. So there's a huge need and managing more conservatively is a way to, sh and shifting to a more resilient portfolio water supply strategy that includes alternative supplies is better for resilience, both for ecosystems and for water supply reliability. And these trends should scare you.
You scare me. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you, dear, for emphasizing the importance of climate in, in our thoughts. That was very helpful, and uh, we appreciate the PowerPoint as well. Um, the next speaker we have is uh, Sarah Perramoon. Is Sarah with us? I suspect with the arrival of the atmospheric river, uh, the traffic will be a mess between here and the Bay Area. So, uh, she took off. She might be on virtual. Okay. Do we see Sarah? Uh, no, I don't see her virtually. Probably got an evening meeting. Um, and I don't see Dr. Bergamoshi here either. Um, so perhaps I could just uh, you, you open the floor virtually. Maya, do we see anyone that we missed who had signed up to speak virtually? I don't think so, but if you can ask them to like raise their hands or something on Zoom, then I can I can see. Uh, okay, yeah. great. Yeah, so Maya says that it's hard to see everyone projecting, but if you could raise your hand and would like to speak virtually, and we uh, passed over you earlier, please raise a virtual hand. Going once, going twice. Oh, so that's that's it. Well, I'd just like to thank everyone. Uh, as I say, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time during these open mic sessions to come out and provide this additional information. It certainly gives us a different perspective. So I'd like to thank all of the folks that came out to talk in the open mic session. And we'll close the public part of the uh, committee meeting now. Uh, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll come back to wrap up uh, you, you know, this second meeting. So thanks everyone for participating both online and uh, making the time to be here and please drive safely in the weather we're just seeing arrive out through the window. <laughs>